rebel force has penetrated the shield and landed on Endor. This is where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Yeah, I got to say, 15 years ago, when we started podcasting about Star Wars, I never thought this day was going to come where we were going to have to say goodbye to the regular weekly show just to cover the new Star Wars content that's coming out. That's exactly what we're about to do for the whole month of March. Uh, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that March is going to feature... For the first time, two brand new Star Wars series simultaneously on Disney+. Plus. We've got Mandalorian Season 3 and The Bad Batch Season 2. Bad Batch on its last uh, six episodes and Mando just getting started. So what that means is a little change in the programming. We are going to have Mando Wednesdays live after shows at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time followed on Thursdays by Bad Batch After Show. That's right. We're going to continue to follow the action of the Bad Batch as it wraps up its season on Thursday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. That's 7 Central. So uh, the regular weekly Rebel Force Radio that you're listening to or watching right now will uh, come back in April. But uh, fear not, we got a great final show uh, coming up here, we've got uh, in the cantina, Paul Bateman. Now, longtime Rebel Force radio listeners know Paul. Paul's been a, uh, a great friend of us here over the years. He's just one of the most foremost experts on uh, Star Wars design, the visual language of Star Wars, in particular, the work of the great late Ralph McQuarrie. Um, Paul really needs no introduction to, uh, like I said, long term. RFR listeners, but Paul's going to be in the cantina. A chance to catch up with Paul. He hasn't been on the show in a long time, so we'll see what he's thinking uh, about Star Wars today. Also, coming up, the world premiere of a brand new video of This Is The Way by Jeff Ulickney. Also, you're not going to want to miss, miss this. We've got some great interview highlights. Liam Neeson, you know, when Liam stops by, it's always a good time. We'll be checking in with him and uh, also Pedro Pascal. So much more uh, coming up on the last Rebel Force Radio Weekly, the flagship show in a few weeks because we've just got so much Star Wars to cover. And here to help me with that in so much more is, of course, the one, the only, my good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mack. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Wars fans. That's right. The last weekly RFR till April. Single tier. Single tier. But Jason, you were looking back in time trying to figure out if there was ever a time where we had to abandon the weekly show and just go with after shows or what have you. And and I do remember one period in our history where it happened. There was overlap? The, it, well, it wasn't. There was it was like there was life, you know, mm. like real life events happening. Okay. Uh, does the month October 2008 ring any <laughs> bells right. for you? October 2008 rings a lot of bells because my daughter was born on the 29th of September 2008. Right. And I knew that was going to sort of take me out of the pocket for a few weeks. How many weeks did I miss for that firstborn? It was easily a month, but I mean, you weren't entirely out of reach for us uh -huh. because you did come back for the round tables once they started oh, to okay. rev up, but we did do a few weeks without you. And it was, it was unfortunate because that was when the Clone Wars was debuting on TV for the very first time. Oh, wow. October, 2008. Yeah. Also... Pete Nadel had left the show the month prior as well. <laughs> so right before you became a dad, Pete Bale, right. who was the original co-host of the Force right. Cast with so Swank. Was there, was there some Billy Mac uh, co-hosting? 
going on? No, I brought in some big guns. I brought in Dave Filoni. I brought in Henry Gilroy. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I had to bring in some big guns. Wow! And then you you came back to the fold, and we really kicked it off with. I think we condensed about three episodes into one after show roundtable, is what we were calling them back yeah. then. But yeah, we did maintain a no weekly show schedule for easily a month that year, maybe even a little bit longer. I filled it up with some micro casts. Yeah. I remember there was a, a big Star Wars Days convention in Plano, Texas that I went to. <laughs> and so I stockpiled a lot of content at that show. Yeah. And Filoni was there as well. And Starting to feel guilty because I think fast forward four years later, 2012, when my son was born, I don't think I missed as many shows when he was born. Oh, you missed a little missed bit. A little bit sure, I don't you, think you I have to. <laughs> no, but it's always different right. with the the, the second. second. The, the first one is 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 the the earth shaking experience. Oh By the time you get to the second one, you got the routine down pat. But but that is a time when we did have to abandon weekly shows wow. and just go with. Roundtable after shows, but I'm, I've been really counting down the days on the calendar for March. Oh, yeah. Mando March, it's happening, and it's coming this upcoming Wednesday, so we have uh, plenty of hype in this show. I'm sure Paul is going to want to talk about Mando Season oh, yeah. 3 and give us his uh, down low on what he thinks is going to happen and, and so much more. Plus... The world premiere of This Is The Way by Jeff Ulysney, Puppet Lando's producer, Jeff Ulysney. It's, this is like if George Martin of the Beatles put out his own song, yeah. you know? And it's a big deal. It's incredible. I mean, I'm telling you guys, you want to stick around for this, the world premiere of This Is The Way. This, it's, it's Weird Al Yankovic level parody song yeah. event. I mean, it's, it's that. It really is. I'm not just saying that lightly. We played plenty of parody songs here over the years on our podcast. I used to host a show called The Galaxy of Music, which featured nothing but Star Wars song parodies. But there are very few that I've ever heard that can match the quality of This Is The Way that will get us so primed for Mandalorian Season 3. We'll be jumping out of our skin. And right into Beskar armor. So right. it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. Well, That's coming. Up. Let's check in with uh, listeners of Rebel Force Radio with uh, listener mail. You must contact me. Play back the entire message. What message? Message after the message. The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. It's a trick. Send no reply. <laughs> Hey guys, got a question for you about Force Lightning. Do we think that it's tied to how someone is connected to the dark side, or is it something more genetic? We saw Rey do it. Is that because Rey was the granddaughter of Palpatine, or is that because Rey was tapping into the dark side? And if it's the dark side, then that means that Darth Maul and Darth Vader both should have been able to do it. So that's my question. If Anakin takes off his gloves, can he shoot Force Lightning out of his fingers? Let me know. You guys are the experts. Crowdsource it. Figure it out. Can't wait for the next episode. <laughs> Later. Crowdsource. Crowds Does that mean we can like crowdfund it? That and make money off of this? Yes, question? please. Let's make money I, off of this. I kid. I kid. Well, <laughs> who was that who called in? We can give him all uh, the uh, all the funds that we... That's Jeremy. Jeremy called in. Jeremy. Patreon supporter Jeremy. Jeremy. So his question is about Force yeah. Lightning. Mm -hmm. um, who could use it? Can, can Vader use it? Can Maul use it? Uh, what's up with Force Lightning? I, I have I've I have some knowledge on the topic. Lay it uh, on us. Well, a lot of people wonder why doesn't Darth Vader use Force Lightning? And I think the uh, the answer is very simple, and it, it's been out there since Revenge of the Sith was released. In the Revenge of the Sith Visual Dictionary, there is um, an entry in there that says, As a result of having artificial arms, Darth Vader will never be able to conjure Sith lightning, nor be invulnerable to it. Well, we know about the invulnerable part, um, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely... Sith light. I think, you know, if you really want to just get down to brass tacks, the lightning would short circuit 
his cybernetics and his respirator and all of that, even if he produced it himself. I don't think Vader's grounded really hmm. that well to be able to handle that sort of thing. I think it would short circuit his bionic. Also, he doesn't, he doesn't I remember have three prongs. Book. He's just the two prong. <laughs> Yeah, he's like an old turntable, and he has that little thing you kind of screw into. So, you know, what <laughs> old school people know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, that little thing at the fork on a wire, and you had to screw it into ground the turntable, oh, yeah. whatever. <laughs> uh, my buddy Steve San- Steve, I always call him Steve Sansweet. His name's Steve Swanson. And like Steve Sansweet, he lives in the Bay Area. So I am forever perplexed by my friendships with these two guys. I, I call <laughs> Sansweet Swanson. I call Swanson Sansweet. It, it's madness. Madness. But he just recently read the book The Rise of Darth Vader, which was an expanded universe novel that came out following the release of Episode 3. And in that book, uh, he reminds me, it says, his arms and legs were mechanical. And he could never cast Force Lightning. So there's something in an expanded universe novel that specifically says Vader cannot do it. So I've given you like a real world version, a uh, reason he can't use it because it'll short circuit his bionics. I've given you a uh, canon version, uh, according to the Visual Dictionary, uh, because of his artificial arms, he can't use Force Lightning. He can't conjure up Force Lightning. Um. And in Rise of Skywalker, I'm giving you an expanded universe reason why he can't do it. It's because his arms and legs were mechanical. Uh, very simple. I mean, it's all right there. Did he use it in The Force Unleashed? I seem to remember in that video game, which was considered canon upon its release, Vader was using Force Lightning. But I mean, that could I never just liked be a that, mechanic though. for a video game, you know? I never liked that. I never liked it because, you know, I always... And this predates, you know, some of the EU. Um, I remember for the longest time, I, I can't remember a time where I ever speculated uh, as to why Vader couldn't use Force Lightning. I always thought it was because of his cybernetic hands. Now, our caller, uh, Jeremy, also brings up Darth Maul. Now, on screen, Darth Maul, I don't know about the comics, I don't know about the novels, but on screen, Darth Maul never conjured up Force Lightning. The only uh, two that we ever saw, well, three, uh, counting Ray, that we ever saw do it on screen was Palpatine and Dooku. Um, as far as mm. Maul, I just don't think Maul ever got that far in his training. That's, and that's that, what I, I always assumed was the reason for Vader not being able to do it. There were certain things that they had to do to introduce the Emperor to audiences in 1983. There were elements they had to give that character that Vader didn't possess to make him appear more powerful than Vader. He was Darth Vader's boss. Why? He's a shriveled up old, old guy in a robe with a hood on it. You know, what makes him... Why why is Darth Vader subservient to this old wrinkled prune? Well, guess what, friends? This cat could make lightning come out of his fingertips. Holy smokes, can't let Vader have that ability. Otherwise, then Vader is on the same level as the Emperor. And that would never work. It would never work because Vader would just use the lightning on him. Some people will say, well, Vader can force choke. He holds up his hand and... Does that, and, but that does that ability doesn't come from the actual fingertips like Force Lightning does. The Force doesn't flow out of just your fingertips. Right. But when a Jedi holds his hand up, it's just a way that he can mentally direct where his Force powers are going to be delivered. And uh, with the Sith Lord, or he, and he wants to Force choke someone. Even Luke did it. And he's not a Sith Lord, but he just sort of gestures to the to the pig guards in Jabba's palace, and they start choking. God, I love that part. That's always one of my yeah. favorite Hello. parts. And he's just so casual God, about I, it too. Yeah. Oh, look at you! Oh, you guys got axes. <laughs> well, guess what? Now you can't breathe. Now it's you can't. The casualness breathe. of it that just kills me every time. I love that. It's I like, mean, boy. that was you know one of those moments is that you know when you see talk about seeing star wars on the big screen for the first time that was one of the moments for me that and he's just got those little, two little fingers that whoa yeah you know uh, it was the first 
real visual example that we were receiving that told us that Luke Skywalker has achieved a new level yeah. in his Jedi knighthood from when we last left him getting a cybernetic hand at the end of Empire Strikes Back. He's leveled up since then. <laughs> and nobody needs to explain it to us in exposition or dialogue or anything no. like, or narration. It's right there. It's right there, just with the simple hand gesture. Suck on this, Gamorians. <laughs> I love it. So I, love I, it. I feel as though, and I know, Jim, you were saying that, you know, perhaps it could also be a, a training uh, or lack of training situation with Vader. Um, I think it's the cybernetic limbs in the case of Vader. I think in the case of Maul, yes. it's it's the lack of training or the, the limitations of his yes. training. Um, now, Yoda does generate sort of the, the the light side version of Force Lightning, if I recall, from his, his face-off with Dooku and Attack of the Clones. He's able to absorb the force lightning, and then send it back as sort of this force energy, which is mm -hmm. more of a, it's certainly not lightning. It's, it's more of a, a mm -hmm. I don't know what you, how you would describe it, but it's energy. That's, being pushed that's out. what Yoda calls. You made the bed. You can sleep in it. <laughs> and then he, <laughs> so he just takes the powers and he's able to compress them and then give it right back right. to them. It's a taste of their own medicine. It is, and I, is what Yoda likes I, to refer I, I don't to know that. what it is. I, I'd have no, uh, you know, other than just what the visual cues that we get in the in the movie. But I, I remember feeling as though, wow, this is some serious power that Yoda is exhibiting here to be able to absorb it yes. and send it back. He's the only one who's been able to do that. Everyone else has been able to, uh, at least those strong enough in the Force, they've been able to hold up their lightsaber and use it sort of as a magnet for the force lightning and let the saber absorb it. So we see Obi-Wan do that. I, I think we see Ray Palpatine do it. Um, as a matter of fact, I know she is. She needs two sabers for that. And then Luke, of course, demonstrates that too, you know, beyond force lightning on Return of the Jedi, when the speeder bike is opening fire on him, he's deflecting the uh, blaster bolts with the saber. And then, of course, there's countless numbers of examples in the prequels and Clone Wars where we see Jedi doing that technique to defend themselves, deflecting blaster bolts. But if you get good at it, you can you can bat it back at the guy who shot it at you. Again, um, that's taught in, uh, you know, Force Techniques 101, a taste of your own medicine. I think Plo Koon teaches that class at the Jedi Temple. So that's what's going on there with Force Lightning. Jeremy's a Patreon supporter, and I love him for uh, supporting us on Patreon. And, of course, by letting us know he's a Patreon supporter, his voicemail receives top priority here on the weekly Rebel Force Radio. So much is going on at Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. There's a new tier, ladies and gentlemen. There is a new way to support Rebel Force Radio on Patreon, and that is RFR Insider Plus. What is RFR Insider Plus? Well, let me tell you. RFR Insider Plus is the way, the only way to get ad-free programming of the weekly Rebel Force Radio and the after shows. So it's uh, a new way to support Rebel Force Radio. You get all the benefits of being an RFR Insider, including every episode of Rebel Force Radio Q&A, but you get the addition of weekly ad-free podcasts, Rebel Force Radio and the after shows. Early bird releases will come back when I can make them happen. Um, it's difficult with the two show per week schedule, but uh, it, it'll come back uh, at some point when Lucasfilm lets us come up for air, which I think will happen <laughs> at some point this summer. I'm not complaining. My God. I mean, I'm really, really so excited to be going after show only in March. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of energy to those after shows. And you guys provide it with your super chats and, and live chats and, and live calls. And we got Tyler there, Tyler Page. It's just a, that's a great energy. So we're looking forward to that. We're looking forward to the return of the Mandalorian. 
And uh, if you're a regular podcast listener of Rebel Force Radio, you want to check out RFR on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Uh, you can, uh, depending on the tier that you're in, you can get uh, bonus podcasts, RFR news, full show video, yeah. and the opportunity to host RFR q &A. And don't forget, with all these after shows coming up, you get to the jump to the head of the line when you do call in. So many benefits. Right. So many benefits. <laughs> we, we forget more than we could remember. There are so many benefits with RFR on Patreon. But thank you so much for your support. It really uh, helps keep RFR alive and vibrant. We really appreciate and love you guys for it. That's patreon.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Rebel Force Radio. <laughs> I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer, I have good news. Well, we got all kinds of good news uh, coming up. We've got Pedro Pascal hanging out with Seth Meyers. We got uh, Deborah Chow and Michelle Rejwan uh, hanging out with uh, the Soundworks channel over on YouTube. All kinds of stuff. But let's let's kick things off here with Pedro Pascal. Uh, Jimmy Mack, as we know, you are always... Always, Coleman, the uh, PR trail of uh, Star Wars celebs, yeah. got your eyes and ears peeled to the late night talk show hosts, and here we got uh, Pedro, who's running around promoting, uh, what is it, The Last of Us? Is, is, is Or is this an, well, a Mandalorian no, uh, stop? He has pivoted, he has pivoted to Mandalorian promotion, and uh, the one place I caught him this week was on uh, Seth Meyers' show. Seth is a Star Wars fan. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. You know, he's he's from the Star Wars generation, as is Pedro Pascal. I just want to start this off by saying, guys, uh, we're going to hear some general Star Wars conversation for Pedro Pascal. He, they don't really talk Mandalorian with him. I th think they read the riot act of Seth Meyers before the show started. Like, he's not going to say anything about season three. Let it go. <laughs> so... <laughs> So Seth is like, hey, whatever. This show's on so late, nobody's watching anyway. And he says, what we're going to do is talk about just basic fandom, you know. And this is what I really love because now we get inside the actor and try to discover what kind of Star Wars fan is he really. Mm -hmm. Is this fandom forged from the opportunity of a lifetime to appear in a Star Wars production? Is that where it begins or guy like Pedro Pascal, like I said, he's from the original Star Wars generation, the fan generation, you know, like you, Swank, like me, and it's inevitable that he has Star Wars in his blood. So uh, Seth Meyers asked him, what was the first Star Wars film he ever saw? We talked in the past, we're, you know, about the same age, obviously Star Wars means a great deal to us. Do you remember, what was the first of the Star Wars you saw? There had to have been a re-release of the first one. Yeah, I think that's right. Because I feel like I saw it in the movie theater. I was traumatized by the trash compactor. Yeah. And I still won't go in one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember in high school, my friends were like going down to the compactor. I'm like, not me. You're like, I'm not doing that. I saw Star Wars. Yeah. Are you kidding? You kidding me? At some point, they compact. <laughs> that's the whole thing. Beheaded Obi-Wan. <laughs> yeah. I remember that traumatizing me as well. Yeah, that, I mean, if you're claustrophobic... That's a tough scene to watch. For me, the, the trash compactor room comes down to one thing and one thing only. Dianoga. <laughs> I don't like <laughs> slimy things that can pull me underwater and constrict my breathing and stuff. I, I'd rather take on the, the walls closing in. I, I think my chances are better oh, okay. so you, than a Dianoga. See, I feel like that with the walls, you know, it's mechanical. It's unforgiving. You know, with 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 the Dianoga, I got a shot. I got a chance. I've got a blaster on my hip. Might be able to get get that to uh, give me. You know, might be able to tackle that. But I don't know about those walls. It's those walls, man. There's much to fear in a trash compactor room. So, like Seth Meyer said, you know, avoid it if you ever have the opportunity to go into one. <laughs> stay out. Right. Stay out. Bad news could happen. So Pedro Pascal with Seth Meyers, he reveals Jason what his favorite Star Wars film is. Ooh. And I, I think you will uh, connect with his answer. I distinctly remember Empire Strikes Back and finally getting tickets to Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Which, if I was being honest, 
is my favorite one. Yes. I know. I'm glad you said that because I, I've, I feel like I've hidden this too. I mean, that was the biggest deal. Now again, it's like we're it not happened allowed to at admit. the right time, right? And everybody now says, "Oh, you know, the Ewoks." It's the yeah. I would say it would because of the Ewoks. I love the Ewoks. <laughs> I love the Ewoks. I was, you know, I was 11 years old or whatever. The Ewoks were exactly what I was looking for in my cinema. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to apologize. I feel like it's like SNL. It's like, you know, it's the cast you grew up with. I'm like, I, the I, Ewoks are my favorite cast. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, so it just must be so cool to be a part of that world now. It's crazy. It's so strange because it's something that's so imprinted in your childhood. And now you're a part of it. And it is a very surreal and uh, big thing that I'm proud of. He's so right, though, about SNL. Because I got to tell you. I remember as a kid <laughs> growing up, not to make this about SNL, but I remember as a kid growing up just idolizing uh, Phil Hartman, uh, Dana Carvey, John Lovitz, Mike Myers. And at that time, uh, Nickelodeon would change its programming in the evening to become Nick at Night. And Nick at Night would often run these uh, hour-long compilations of yeah. classic SNL, the Belushi era. Right, right. Yeah. And I remember yeah. my mom sitting there just laughing at the Belushi stuff, you know, the Killer Bees, the Coneheads, all that stuff. And for me as a kid, it just went over my head. I'm like, I don't find this funny at all. Land Shark, I don't find, you know, remotely oh, funny. funny, funny. Um <laughs> As I've gotten older, I can go back and I can now appreciate that stuff. I, I know, you know, American history better. I, I, I feel like I know the culture better. But uh, it is about, uh, just like with SNL, as Seth, you know, kind of uh, points out there, Star Wars is a, is a lot like that. It's about what you grew up with. And for me, I did grow up with the cast of the Ewoks and Jabba's Palace. And I feel like I had the same moment with Jabba's Palace, Jim, that you had with the cantina in terms of it just oh. totally blowing your mind and captivating you. That's nice to hear because a lot of times critiques of the Jabba sequence can sound like this. Oh, it's George's attempt to make the Muppet show. <laughs> oh, it's George's attempt to fill the toy box. And thus... His bank vault. <laughs> right. Um, so it was critiqued a little bit. I mean, things were looked at as kind of silly. Even the, the Gamorrean guards were kind of like. I remember this, you, you, know, dark, you calling. Dark crystal. I remember here, you uh, calling a Gamorrean guard Muppety at one point. Muppety. Uh, mu yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what saves the Gamorrean guard, though? What's that? From full out Muppety. Is they put all that drool on its jaw, yeah. on its chin. Yeah. You know, it's drooling. They did not do that in the Boba Fett show. They ignored right. the drool. You're right. Those Gamorians in the Boba Fett show were a little off. They're kind of malnourished <laughs> Gamorians. <laughs> they really are. We talked about their dad yeah. bods. Well, they also don't have enough drool. Dad bods. <laughs> They're full on topless. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> No drool. Right. You have to drool. It's a weird you know? choice. Sometimes people try to clean up certain bodily fluids that are essential for the operation of the the human uh, machine. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little health tip PSA. Well, Pedro Pascal um, making the rounds on uh, Mando, because it seems like yes. yesterday he was making the rounds about The Last of Us. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and, and he's getting a, a heck of a lot of accolades for that. I've not seen that show. I'm hearing great things about it. Jim, have you watched any of that, The Last of Us, with Pedro? They're binging it upstairs ah, as we speak. Okay, but you've not... I have not dipped my mm. toes into The Last of Us. I'm, I'm actually considering another Pedro Pascal series that has been recommended to me for years, and I haven't watched it yet. Narcos. Oh, I've heard... Narcos. Yeah, my brother's a big I, fan I am, of that. I'm interested in Narcos. Mm -hmm. Back to news, uh, Liam Neeson. Boy, this everybody was sending this to us. <laughs> Yeah, Everybody we did receive. Was... Uh, I, I know Paul from Alulu was all over this. <laughs> Remember Alulu? Oh, where yeah. We had our uh, RFR live on the South Side during Celebration 2019. Uh, yeah, oh. Paul is uh, he's still listening to RFR. He's still showing up at Galping Ghost Hangs, and he sends me emails. And 
He's like, dude, you got to see Liam Neeson <laughs> with Andy Cohen on Watch What Happens Live. Weird thing on uh, Andy Cohen's show, he has listeners uh, like calling in, asking questions of the talent. And I don't think they cleared anything with Liam because he looked really, uh, he almost looked kind of frosted when uh, the question of Star Wars came up. A listener asked him if he would consider being Qui-Gon Jinn in his own Disney Plus series. Okay. When he brought it up, Liam, like, he went back and put his hands over his eyes like, oh, God, not this again. <laughs> and... <laughs> He did. Really? He did. Wow. There's something interesting evolving with Liam Neeson <gasps> and his relationship with Star Wars, which I find kind of weird. Uh, let's hear what he had to say, though, on Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen. Uh, when the listener asked him, or the viewer asked him, if he would consider starring in a Disney Plus series about Qui-Gon Jinn. Are you interested in doing your own spinoff on Disney Plus? No, I, I'm not. It's, uh, there's, there's so many... Spin-offs of Star Wars. It's diluting it to me, and it's taken away the mystery and the magic in a weird way, you know? I, it, was, it was nice to do the little bit with Ewan uh, after 25 years, 24 years, you know? We did a TV version, and <laughs> I appeared in the last episode. I had two <laughs> lines to say. Two lines. <laughs> Two lines. And that was cool. I loved it, man. Yeah. But that's it. Yeah. yeah. Liam, I love how outspoken you are. You really do not give a f <laughs> <laughs> Andy Cohen telling me like it is. I love how outspoken you are. You just don't give a you know what. Um, wow. I, I, I got to say, I'm a little surprised. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because... He did just appear as Qui Gon in in uh, right in, in the, the Kenobi series. Uh, in fact, so much of the show was, at least in in Obi Wan's journey, was leading up to the moment where he connects with Qui Gon, and I th I thought it was a beautiful cameo. It was great to have Liam there. I'm I'm su I'm surprised and a little disappointed that. Um, he sees it that way. But Jim, his take on Star Wars has never been quite, in my judgment, accurate. I, I, I don't think Liam mm. sees Star Wars the way we as, as fans see it. Well, he said there's too many spinoffs. Yeah. All right. That's one reason why he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to be lost in the mix. He, 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 he enjoys the reverence. Of Qui Gon Jinn, mm -hmm. he he likes what he did. He made his mark on the franchise all those years ago. He he's an older guy now, and that's all in the past. Yeah, you know. But also, I think a lot of people are are missing the thing that Liam doesn't do TV. Liam Neeson does not do he's television. He's a movie star. Yeah, he's a movie he's, star. Yeah, and you can kind of hear it. When the listener asks him about being on Disney Plus, he says, Well, I've already been on Disney Plus. I did the thing with you and at the end. And he goes, he looks at Paul Rudd. He's like, It's this TV thing I did. It's uh, like he can't even believe he did television. He got lowered down to television actor status, <laughs> even to return as Qui Gon Jinn. Right now, doing the voice in Clone Wars and everything, which he did so over the in the past right, without right. reluctance. I mean, that's okay. He just they put a microphone in front of him. He's that's nothing. Or he makes a phone call online, whatever it was. <laughs> But showing up on the set, putting on makeup and wardrobe. The hair extensions. Going through rehearsals to be on a TV show? Well, no way, man. Not for Liam Neeson, film star. <laughs> so I think he, he kind of, I think this is more about movies than yeah. Star Wars. But I mean, I don't know. What do I know? I mean, remember a few years ago, he's, he asked the question, is Star Wars starting to fade away? Well, he seemed to think so. I'm wondering, is Star Wars starting to fade away? Yeah. Why is he feeling that? He's he's feeling that it's it's too much. It's it's. I mean, I wouldn't know what he's thinking, 
but I know somebody who would. Oh, you don't think? Well, I think if we? if we really, you know, focus on our feelings and tap into the force, we can maybe conjure up a visit from the ghost of Qui John. If we can, I mean, this is a collective effort. I'm asking our listeners to do the same. Reach out. Everyone just, it's like I'm a what TV do they always preacher. say? You know, it's like center on your feelings, right. focus on your feelings. Reach out yeah. with your feelings. That's what we're all doing right, right now. Here we go. I'm feeling a little indigestion right now. I, I don't know if that's going to help, but. Um, I'm closing my eyes right now, just, I'm focusing on Kwai John. Swank. Whoa. Swank. What? <laughs> Master Qui Gon, this is uh, this is something else. I, I I'm honored, and it's I, it's great to have you here on Rebel Force Radio. Uh, there's there's been a disturbance in the Force, Master. Anakin. Anakin. No. <laughs> remember when I did that one, Swank? Yeah, I I do. <laughs> I remember. I remember. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, sure, you know. How you doing, I, Swank, you little bastard? Oh, well. Uh, I've I, been missing you, you know. I, I, I'm doing fine, Master. I, we, we just, we're trying to make uh, heads or tails here about uh, the idea of, uh, you know, Star Wars getting too diluted. Um, w- would you like to see a, a series come out all about you and, and your adventures? And we saw a little bit of that with uh, Tales of the Jedi, uh, young Qui Gon with his uh, with his master of uh, Count Dooku, but what what about something that's all about Qui Gon? Well, you know, Swank. There's been so many spinoffs of Star Wars. It's diluting it. But to me, it is at least. It's weird, you know. It's taking away all the magic and the mystery, you know. Yeah. So I have a message. This message is for all the top brass at Disney and Lucas Films. I don't know who you are. I don't know what you want. If you're looking for box office sales and Disney Plus subscriptions, I can tell you, I don't have money. But what I do have are a very particular set of skills. Skills I've acquired over a very long career. Lightsaber skills that make me a nightmare for people like you. (laughs) If you stop crapping out nonstop Star Wars spinoffs that remove the mystery and the magic... I'll go now, and that will be the end of it. I will not look for you. I will not pursue you. But if you don't, I will look for you. I will find you, and I will kill you. Whoops. (laughs) Got to fix my mouth. (laughs) Oh, yeah, sure you know. (laughs) So that's just a message for all the brass who think they can just fart out a Kwai John show. You Uh, you would require quite a bit, I I think, of... uh, a strategy behind the show, a, a, a lot of uh, foresight, forethought. It just it just can't be something that they decide to do and then they're 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 shooting it in a in a few months. It, it's really got to be planned out. There's always a bigger fish, Swank. And remember, whenever you gamble, my friend, eventually you lose. Just like Watto, you know, that son of a bitch. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sure you know. Wow, well... Don't center on your anxiety, Swank. No, no. Concentrate. Definitely not. Here and now, where it belongs. Yeah. On the living force, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, those are words to live by. Uh, your profundity when it comes to uh, force, parables, and all of that are, are amongst our favorite. And we love you for it. Well, thank you, Swank, and may the force be with you. You know, when you're starting to fade, maybe my my faith, my belief is no. Oh, oh Swank, concentrate oh, on the moment. To... <laughs> no, <laughs> I was trying to concentrate, and my concentration got broken. Uh, wow, what a moment! What a moment! The ghost of Qui Gon Jinn here, a, uh, a special guest dropping by on Rebel Force Radio. And uh, Jim, not only did we have Liam Neeson saying that uh, he wasn't interested, but the ghost of Qui Gon himself was saying that un- uh, unless there was a lot of thought given to this, this wasn't something he just wanted uh, the, the the Disney folks to just kind of, uh, you know, as he said, fart it out. He, he wanted some real um, 
you know, so, some real substance behind any kind of potential Qui Gon Jinn series. Well, that's what we all of us fans want. Now, I did not, I didn't get the vision of Qui Gon, the ghost of Qui Gon. I didn't see that. You must be more connected to the Force than I am. Really? So you didn't hear but, or see any yeah. of that? No, I wow. was just trying to you know, fill in the blanks and things you were saying. But um, yeah, yeah. now that you've told me what was going on there, I agree with the uh, the spirit that had dis- descended upon us. And I think that <laughs> quality should be the... Uh, <laughs> The, the main word here, you know, oh. somebody should tattoo it on Bob Iger's forehead so everyone sees it when he walks in the room. Not me. Quality. Quality. Just Quality. like it's happening everywhere. I mean, it's not just Liam Neeson who's saying it. I mean, I'm seeing stuff everywhere about now Marvel fatigue. We dance this dance with Star Wars. Now we're going to dance the dance with Marvel. You know, the, the uh, impossibly impenetrable Marvel is now showing signs of weakness. There's cracks in the armor now where there, you know, fans are saying that the direction needs to be reassessed and insiders are starting to say that too i'm seeing more and more articles appear about marvel burnout marvel fatigue bob Iger saying he's gonna make a leaner meter disney uh kevin feige there's rumors that he wants out of marvel now and wants a a bigger seat at the table at disney Mm. He wants to be one of the big fat cats up there in the hey, ivory maybe tower. Maybe he's angling for uh, Iger's gig. You know, he's not going to be there for much longer. Well, hey, you know, that's right. Yeah. You know, people are scrambling to get in position for when the next Iger retirement happens. Mm-hmm. You're absolutely right, Jason. Kevin Feige's a fool if he's not recognizing that opportunity. And uh, he could be the guy. He could be the guy. And that could have... Uh, you know, that could be great for all of Disney, or it could be another Bob Chapik nightmare. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? It's, uh, you know, we're dealing with corporate overreach of such extreme these days where these guys own so much and they control so yeah, much. It's too much. It's, it's like, how much can you control before you're spreading yourself too thin as a corporation even? I mean, we worry about that as individuals all the time. As a corporation, though? I think we're starting to see the bubble burst with all kind of different entertainment these days. It's really interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. But what's next for Star Wars? What's next for streaming? We had uh, a lot of streaming this past year, 2022, Book of Boba Fett and or, and of course, Kenobi. So we're still talking about Obi-Wan Kenobi. DJ Sequest gave us a tip that Deborah Chow, director of Kenobi and executive producer Michelle Rejwan, um, they appeared on a show called Soundworks Collection, and uh, it, it's kind of a... It's a YouTube channel. It was kind of a lightweight sort of... Yeah, it, it was kind yeah. of a lightweight sort of interview, um, but there there are a, a couple of interesting nuggets here, um, uh, specifically the, the mindset of Deborah Chow as she was directing these episodes. She, she wanted this show to be all about the repercussions of Order 66, and here she expands on that a little bit. As we continued with the development, it sort of became, for me at least, thematically clear that so much of what the show was about was about trauma. And it was about dealing with the weight and the responsibility and the choices that were made um, in Revenge of the Sith and the prequels. And, you know, Order 66, if there was a pivotal event for our story, it was Order 66. And almost every character or major character for us was grappling with that, you know, even to Leia and, you know, what happened to the twins. Um, so, so much of it, of, of our story was about dealing with what happened after Order 66, um, that it became a really interesting starting point emotionally because it was so character driven. It was about people that were dealing with something and dealing with choices that Anakin made um, and what happened to the, you know, the Jedi Council and to so much of everything that happened in the galaxy. Um, so it was a big story to tell, you know, in a very sort of intimate way for all these characters. Yeah, the ramifications. Um, and I like that she uses the word trauma. I mean, it it is. It's, uh, it's tragic. I mean, George set out when he wrote the and uh, refined the story of Anakin Skywalker and his fall to uh, become Darth Vader. It is uh, the epitome of tragedy. And so I think what Michelle or what Deborah is talking about here um, makes a lot of sense to me. That is a huge theme in Kenobi. Um, 
the repercussions of Order sixty six and 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 the decisions. I, I I like she says not just Order sixty six, but then the decisions that Anakin Skywalker made in those two events combining uh, created well, sensibly the biggest uh, shock to the galaxy uh, in what. How many thousands of years was, you know, the, the status quo upheld with the uh, the old mm -hmm. republic? A long, long time. And this was really the big event, those two things. And it's, you know, people don't snap back very quickly, very easily from those, you know, those types of events. And so to see it explored in all those characters, um, yeah, I think that Deborah was, was was grounded in the right in the right way for this series. And in an individual, personal level, as far as the character of Obi-Wan goes, you get to see how he's dealing with all of that and how he's left alone and how he's, he's beat up from it. He doesn't want to be there on Tatooine, living in a cave. He's living a fat life on Coruscant up in that Jedi temple, <laughs> being pampered and uh, living a good life, you know? I mean, as far as the, the monk-like Jedi pamper themselves he was he was pampered he was much more pampered than living in a cave buying scrap from jawas right all right that sucks that's a sucky life. that tea having to go out to a big fish dead in the middle of the dune sea and chopping up its meat how come that meat didn't spoil too in that big yeah why fish? didn't it get him food like poisoning like i got from my reuben sandwich yeah really really it, that kind of looked like Corned beef. No, they he were was feeding it to an EOP, too. and they've got cast iron stomachs. Those EOPs. Right, right. Yeah, Obi Wan wouldn't eat that crap himself. He knows what's up in there. Right. It's probably all maggot infested. <laughs> I mean, when you think about it, that big fish has been sitting out there since Tatooine used to be covered with water, and then it evolved. There was some catastrophic event, natural event that made Tatooine become a sand planet. So that fish has been out there since Tatooine was a planet covered in water, and the meat is still good. That's right, it's a whale of some sort. That's pretty yeah. bizarre. <laughs> and they, it's out being baked under two suns for how many thousands right, not of just years? One sun, but two and the suns, meat so things, is still good. Things are going to spoil twice as fast. Uh, <laughs> Listen, we've learned. We've learned. You cannot apply the laws of science and physics to the Star Wars universe uh -huh. ever. No. There is sound in space. That's as far as we go. You know, <laughs> hey, there's sound in space. Anything can happen in this crazy universe. We could eat an old fish. But so it's interesting to see how Obi Wan goes from that guy to being the guy who eventually takes Luke Skywalker uh, on the first steps of his journey. Could Obi Wan have done that without going through the experience he goes through in the Kenobi series? Well, we always accepted it as, of course, he. he right. We saw it. it. It all made sense to us. He was out there in the middle of the desert waiting for Luke to get older. And in the meantime, he was communicating with the spirit of Qui Gon Jinn and continuing his Jedi training. We didn't realize there was a lot of downtime. We didn't realize there was trauma to be dealt with. A lot of downtime. I these, mean, these. You figure Luke's what ten when we meet him in uh, in Kenobi, right? Maybe eight. Okay, ten. That's a long one. time for him to be stranded on that planet without communing with someone like Qui Gon. So, you know, really, what we have to do is we look back at that and see of his, his of his time being marooned on Tatooine and hiding. Only half that time he's actually making you know, as far as we know, real progress in his understanding as a Jedi Knight through Qui-Gon. Because eight years goes by until, eight or ten years goes by until he's able to successfully connect mm -hmm. with Qui-Gon. We did it in a couple so you of have minutes, to assume, just, a, you know, just a, long, a little while ago. So you have to assume then at the end of the Kenobi series, he's back in the cave, right back to where he started. But what's different? Well, he's leveled up. Mm-hmm. And now he's communicating with Qui-Gon Jinn, the ultimate level up. So where do you go from there? You keep leveling up, right? Mm -hmm. You're communicating with Qui-Gon Jinn. He's giving you all the secrets to the mysteries of the universe, and this is great. Right. Even Yoda pops in from time to time. What a hoot. <laughs> Better than Zoom. Do we think so? It's funny to bring up Yoda. Do we, do we think that Yoda well, shows up? Well, he does say that, for a long time, he's watched Luke 
In this one, a so long Yoda time has I have an watched. ability. Yeah. He has an ability to uh, to be present on Tatooine. Mm-hmm. That we know, present enough to be able to observe Luke, present in the Force. Well, so the first um, time I, yeah. I would look to Empire Strikes Back, and and the, the, the first time that we see the go the ghost of Obi Wan there with Yoda on Dagobah. There's no surprise. You know, Yoda does not act surprised. He just, it's like, oh, yeah, Obi-Wan's here. Yeah, to Obi-Wan, you listen, you know, he says to, to Luke. So um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you do get the sense that, th- that the two have been in communication throughout the years, that, that they're, they're certainly not, not strangers. So Yes. Yeah. Or at the very least, that was one of the first stops the spirit of Obi-Wan made after he was struck down yeah, by Yeah, that Vader could be, too. That could be, too. I mean, where where do you go after that? Now, oh, I got to tell Yoda. But but there is <laughs> Anakin chopped me in half. There is precedent <laughs> and, for two living Force users to feel and sense that connection. We see it with Luke and Vader after the uh, the, the, the the duel on Bespin. You know, father, son. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there, there's that communication. Mm-hmm. Um, though it seems a little mm-hmm. stilted, it doesn't seem as as free as what what we see happening on Dagobah, but I I, I, th- I like to think that they're communing with each other while Obi-Wan is there. That's what I think Luke learned the truth. He could have thought Vader was lying to him about being his father, but it was when they had that little bit of, because he said, no, that's not true, mm-hmm. that's impossible. Mm-hmm. Search your feelings, you know it's to be true. He says, no. And then he's like, I'm going to kill myself. Right. (laughs) Maybe because he did know the truth at that moment. Search your feelings, you know it's to be true. Why does Luke let go to fall to his death? It's because he can't live with the, 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 the burden of knowing Darth Vader is his father. And that's the first thing he does. And is, is, is it a getaway plan? I don't think so. I think he's, he's looking to end it at that time. Yeah. That's kind of heavy, and, and I don't like talking. No, about no, really I, I think it is. I think Wars. I think he is feeling as though if if he does hold the key, if he is the key to Vader acquiring more power over the galaxy, regardless mm. of the father son relationship or not, he's going to just take himself out of it, sacrifice himself yeah. so Vader doesn't, to use your term, one up. Or level up yeah. by acquiring level Luke. up. That's good. I like that. It's more of a selfless act as yeah. opposed to um, you know my version, which is kind of selfish. Um, can't live with knowing Vader's his day. Right? No, no. It's bigger than that. Luke is looking to save the galaxy. Um, someone else who saved the galaxy many times is Leia Organa. And uh, she was a kid once, just like all of us. And they decided to insert her into the Kenobi series, which was a surprise to all of us, quite honestly. And uh, Deborah Chow, and she talks a little bit about casting Vivian Lyra Blair as young Leia. That was definitely an undertaking. And I think Michelle and I probably saw every single kid (laughs) between the ages of 8 and 12 in the universe trying to cast a young version of not only one of the most iconic female characters ever, and then in addition, played by Carrie Fisher, one of the most iconic women ever, um, is no small task, you know? So it it was really challenging. And, you, you know, with kids, like so much of what you're trying to find is just sort of the innate character and find it in them, you know, because they're, you know, oftentimes they, you know, they're not quite there to be able to put it on fully like that. Um, So I think the thing that we were really looking for is we were trying to find the balance of, you know, having the wit and having the intelligence and the humor of Carrie, um, but not losing sight that she is a kid and that she's a person. You know, we didn't want her to get too uber precocious and have it, you know, just be sort of smart alecky all the time. Um, So I think, you know, we were we were really lucky to find Vivian. Honestly, she she just kind of had it in herself. Um, and, you know, and that is no small order to be that young and to walk onto a set like that with such huge actors around you and knowing that you're trying to fulfill and step into those shoes. Um, you know, I don't think I could have done that at that age. Uh, and I think she just did a, an incredible job, honestly. So limiting the amount of precociousness uh, was foremost on their minds. I like knowing that 
they were going into this saying, okay, we, we, we have to, we have to put limits on how smart alecky to use her term, uh, this character can be though at the same time, we want this character to be believable as a, as a, as a young Leia. Um, so no, I, I, I appreciate that. And, uh, you know, Vivian Lyra Blair, I feel, um, you know, in spite of some of the, maybe the directorial uh, issues we might have with Kenobi, you know, the, uh, uh, when she runs away from him there at the one point and some of that yeah. stuff, uh, yeah. despite all of that, her her performance, I think is is great. And I love the chemistry that she and you and have on the on the screen. They pushed it a little bit too much having her getting chased through the woods by those kidnappers. You know, yeah. any attempt to make a kid that age into an action hero in any way, shape, or form is misguided typically. Right. You know, rarely do we see that being pulled off convincingly. And uh, that was a lot, a lot of people had. Uh, critiques of Kenobi because of that chase through the forest with Flea and the gang pursuing her. <laughs> I forgot her. that was I mean, it, it looked slapsticky <laughs> almost. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it could have done without it. And I've seen fan edits online where they just cut right to the chase and they put the the hood over young Leia and they, they kidnap her just yeah. like what would happen. Right. You know, I, I, I mean, that's even, that's the action... In that sequence is borderline precocious, you know. I'm not talking about the dialogue. I'm talking about the Just actual the action, movement. right? Yeah, the action. It was unnecessary yep. and silly, um, but eh, you know, those are easy to overlook. And like I said, there's fan edits online that uh, if it really bothers you, you can give those a shot. Michelle Rajwan, she was the, uh, one of the executive producers of this series, along with Kathleen Kennedy. Michelle uh, was formerly a Lucasfilm executive, and now she's uh, moved into uh, the producer's suite where she came from, essentially. And uh, I don't think her her time with Lucasfilm is going to be going on much longer. Usually a demotion like that indicates you're on the way out the door. And uh, Michelle, she made her mark on the Rise of Skywalker, on the Willow series, and on the Kenobi series. And she gets asked by uh, the Soundworks Collection about a second season of Kenobi. And uh, if we can get our hopes up for something like that happen. And here's what Michelle had to say. It really was always conceived to stand alone as, as the six-part story. And, you know, that it, it felt really like the journey, as Deborah described, for Obi-Wan, what really felt complete. And so it, it was certainly designed that way, of course, your mind always wanders to the possibilities and, you know, nothing would be more joyful than working with you. And again, seeing the character return, but as, as you know, we began this process, it's always about why it's always about the story. It's all, it's always about really letting it reveal itself to be something worthy, but, you know, truthfully, it was always designed as, as a limited event and we felt it was worthy of one and, you know, we're, I think, all very satisfied with where we where we left the character and feel like it was a real journey worth going on with him emotionally. And, you know, the other brilliant thing about Star Wars and the way George designed it is there's always, of course, a hunger to know more, to speculate more, to dream about what the possibilities of story that you may not see, you know, on, on screen are. But that's also what makes the world feel so limitless and um, exciting and, you know, always sort of like endlessly imaginative. So I think we also really like that it, it felt complete um, and that, yeah, so as tempting as it is, uh, it was it was meant it was designed to be a limited story. That's a big no, by the way. <laughs> that's a, that sure sounds that's like a it big does No, they are but really again, closing I mean, the door. But is it? Are they closing the door for their involvement in a second season or are they closing the door? Because as you said, Jim, earlier, you know, this is per perhaps Michelle is on her way out of the company. Um, so is it sort of like their own way of saying, well, you know, if there's a second season, we're not going to be involved. Um, or are they just closing the door on any potential for a second season? Her post at Lucasfilm was Senior Vice President of Live Action Development and Production. I mean, she was way up oh, there. Yeah. She 
Kathleen Kennedy's right hand man. And now she has uh, stepped away from the position to transition back into being a full time producer. I mean, if you do the math, it, it's it's clearly a demotion. And uh, she has signed a deal with Lucasfilm and Walt Disney Studios to be a producer and continues to maintain an office at Lucasfilm. But that might be kind of awkward, you know, to go from being such a high-ranking member of the executive team yeah. to now... She's not making any decisions. Just being She's another not producer. You're anything. just another right. producer. She's now. not making any core decisions She's not directing the uh, the future of live action storytelling in Star Wars. Right. Uh, she might hitch a ride in the production of some of those those stories once they're green. Her name is still attached yeah. to the Taika Waititi film. Mm. Should that go into production, That's never going to happen. And as as we know, I mean, it, it's still on maybe one of the burners there at Lucasfilm. But I think he's a flake. It, it, it appears to have <laughs> lost a lot of. Momentum. I think Tyka's a flake. That's what I think. <laughs> I think you're right. And I think a lot of people are beginning to realize that. Yeah. Uh, he has been very successful, but maybe uh, independent type film projects are more his speed. Yeah. Things that he can fully control. Exactly. As opposed to being a spoke on the wheel of one of the biggest film franchises of all time. Right. I don't think he's a- It's no easy task. And I don't fault Tyka if that isn't his bag. Right. And uh, I don't follow Lucasfilm and Disney if Taika has become a bit of a handful. So, um, you know, those elements, you put them into the equation and it doesn't look good for Taika's film. But it hasn't been fully uh, canceled outright at this point. But neither is Ryan Johnson's film trilogy either, which we know there's a snowball chance for that to happen. Right, and that won't get officially uh, canceled, maybe not ever, but certainly not while Kathleen Kennedy is there. Because I think those two are yep. real friendly. Yeah, Michelle got into Lucasfilm via Bad Robot when JJ was producing yeah. The Force Awakens, and uh, KK took a liking to her, and she skyrocketed up uh, through the ranks to Senior Vice President of Live Action Development and Production. Wasn't That's she Star Wars? Wasn't ladies she Jeff and Garland's assistant at one point? Oh, wasn't she? Uh, that's how he ended up in. Episode nine, right? Well, at least on the cutting. I think room that was one of her of first nine. gigs there in Hollywood. I think you're right. I think she did serve as an assistant, to and then Jeff, she was which also probably no easy task. I think she also was, was with the uh, Weinstein there for a while, wasn't she? No, no, no. You are thinking of the showrunner for the Acolyte. Oh, the right. Acolyte. Right. Sorry. Another Lucasfilm executive who came on board with the Disney acquisition of Star Wars. She was actually, I think she worked in Kathleen Kennedy's office when KK came over to Lucasfilm. Rain Roberts Mm -hmm. was part of that team. Yeah. And that's how she got involved in Star Wars. And now she's executive producer of The Acolyte. And Rain does not have a very long credits record. And I spoke to her backstage at Star Wars Celebration 2015, and she was lovely. I mean, just what a what a nice person. But but her pedigree of Star Wars, I could tell from that conversation, was slim at best. Mm-hmm. I did not get the feeling she understood what Star Wars was all about. I, I think she came in very cold into Star Wars. Now, granted, I'm talking about 2015. That was eight years ago. Yeah. You know, maybe she was a fast learner, but. That sort of stuff makes me nervous. Again, she seemed like the nicest in the world, but again, I'm sure Michelle Rejwan is a nice person too, but I don't think she was cut out for the gig. I don't think she had the pedigree that to be senior vice president of live action development and production. She has now been forced out of that spot, and she's back to being a producer. I've seen the result of her work, The Rise of Skywalker, Willow, and uh, I, I think she was attached to Andor, but you know that that was a Tony Gilroy show oh, altogether. Sure. And uh, Willow and Kenobi. Yeah. So, you know, uh, we're not talking about the greatest Star Wars ever made. Right. Hey, you know what I just noticed? My, my drink's a little low, so we want to get into the cantina here with Paul Bateman. We don't leave him. Well, oh, we got to do the music video. Yeah, no, we're going to do the music video. 
what is this world? This premiere. is the world premiere, Swank. Yeah. With, let's swank with great power comes great responsibility, <laughs> and when we have the world premiere happening, it can't get bumped like so many Star Wars and pop culture <laughs> segments. Right. This one has to show up on the uh, radar of all Star Wars fans because we're celebrating. I mean, this is we're, we're rolling into the season premiere this is of Mandalorian. Mando We've been Eve. waiting. Mando season three. We've been waiting more than two years. Yeah. We've been waiting more than two years. That's a long time to wait for the man. Well, we did have the Boba Fett thing, which was that kind of uh, satisfied my Jones, at least. But come on. I want more. I'm a Mando junkie. I need more. I need more. You just gave me a taste. Give me a full hit. And so to celebrate... Season three happening. We have a new song. I'm telling you, this is weird Al Yankovic level quality Star Wars parody. Words and music by Jeff Ulisney, inspired by the band Fastball. Fastball fans will recognize why in just a minute. And I was, I, I love this. The second I heard it, I immediately put together a little music video to accompany it, featuring uh, stills from the first two seasons of The Mandalorian. And that was a lot of fun. So our uh, Patreon supporters at the RFR All Access level, you'll be able to uh, see this video. And I think we'll put it on the YouTube as well okay? so everyone could see it. Because Jeff did such a great job with this. I love it. It's This Is The Way. 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 He took on the job and he started hunting. He left before the sun came up that day. A contour of best God he was wanting. But where is he going while knowing that this is the way? He rescued the child, then he got to thinking. The empire is not his place to stay. He broke into their base and started shooting. But where is he going while knowing that this is the way? Anyone can see the clan that they started is only two. He's got in a quest that he has to see through. To protect the foundling, deliver him home some way. You can see Moff Gideon hiding in space out there. He's hunting them down, but they really don't care. The child and the Mando were happier there today. Today, the armorer said, You now have a foundling. Return him to his kind somehow, someday. But until then, him but where are they going while knowing that this is the way anyone can see the clan that they started is only two he's got in a quest that he has to see through to protect the foundling deliver him home some way you can see my giddy and hiding out there. He's hunting them down, but they really don't care. The child and the Mando were happier there today. Today. Anyone can see the clan that they started is only two. He's got in a quest that he has. 
to see through to protect the foundling, deliver him home some way. You can see Moth Gideon hiding in space out there. He's hunting them down, but they really don't care. The child and the Mando were happier there today. Today. Fantastic. Great work by Jeff Ulyssini. Thank you so much, Jeff, for uh, sending that our way. Really good uh, selection of photos to go along with uh, Jeff's great <laughs> lyrics there. Oh, that was the easy part. I loved his music, and I loved his singing on that, and the lyrics, just everything about it got me hyped up for Mandalorian Season 3. So look for the music video to show up on YouTube. We'll make that available to everyone. And I just want to thank Jeff for, number one, he's Puppet Lando's producer. Yeah. He's there with Puppet Lando in the studio. That's no easy task. No. And, I mean, imagine the demands from Puppet Lando and all the all the the pampering he right. requires. Right. It, it's it's a lot. Yeah, so this is Jeff the George is Martin. This is the Phil that. Ramon of Rebel Force yes. Radio and uh, Puppet Lando. Can only imagine what it's like. So what a great job. I'm sure Jeff is going to make that also available as a track you can download. So uh, we'll make all that information available at rebelforceradio.com. So we'll be back with Paul Bateman in the cantina right after this. Rebel Force Radio. Star Wars, Star Wars Cantina. Where are you going, Master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. Paul Bateman. Paul Bateman. Hey. I would love to have some uh, Bateman speculation on Skeleton Crew because it does seem to be such a mystery. And it is shooting over there or already shot over your way, right? Yeah, I can probably just go over nose. <laughs> just go and find out. Excuse me. Yeah, just and ask around town. <laughs> Look, we're just a podcast. There's not many people that listen. It's perfectly fine. You can tell us everything. Right. You yeah. tell. <laughs> yeah. I've tried that before. Yeah. <laughs> but it was the one. It was the one that came out of the blue, and I feel like it's the one we know the least yeah. about. And the claim is mm. that it's not going to tie into anything else that we've that we've seen so far yeah i don't know until it doesn't do very well and then like baby yoda will be in it straight away <laughs> really yeah, season right. two. yeah of course the Grogu Chronicles. yeah <laughs> but uh, no, i don't happen. know i mean they're saying like stranger things aren't they or yeah. that kind of vibe like kind right. of kids in it but not for kids exclusively and stuff so right yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's going to tie into the whole kind of Thrawn thing because they're talking about them. It's a bit of a lost in space situation, isn't it, where they're out in the middle of nowhere. So it's going to be all new stuff. Yeah, and, I did uh, hear remote. that, that maybe this is the way, this is the way, no pun intended, mm, this is the way. that uh, Thrawn might get introduced, mm. that that Thrawn could show up yeah. with skeleton, it, skeleton Crew first, which would put it yeah. after... Ahsoka, season one of Ahsoka, do you think that we could go a whole season of Ahsoka and not meet Thrawn? Because we're going to see Ahsoka before we before uh, Skeleton Crew. Yeah, I can't see that, can you? I think I think they're bound to bring him in. Although they might, I suppose they might wait until the last couple of episodes and go, da-da, Thrawn. Yeah, you know, maybe they introduce Thrawn towards the end of Ahsoka, yeah. and then we get to know a little bit more about who he is through something like skeleton mm. crew it could expound mm. maybe maybe thrawn is going to mm. be the the glue that takes us into uh, skeleton i don't know crew. i'm looking forward to seeing him do we know yet who's playing him i mean i know there are all the rumors about it being the guy that did the voice but we've not had confirmation yet have we 
No. And as a matter of fact, he's denied it. Uh, Mickelson. Really? Not Mads Mickelson. Uh-huh. What's his brother's name? Lars? Lars. Lars. Lars yeah. Mickelson. Well, was he has yeah. he has denied it, but of course we know that mm. actors uh, potentially uh, who end up in the Star Wars universe they 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 lie th- straight through their teeth when it comes to Star Wars. Uh, a lot of them do it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. From uh, yeah. even old school guys like uh, oh yeah sure you know Qui Gon Jinn <laughs> and uh, yeah. oh there's a uh, so Swank has a picture here of. Jude Law in Skeleton Crew. And yeah, he's got a scarf on it. It looks like he's being approached by three of those uh, droids that came out of Jabba the Hutt's door. I love that guy. Yeah. So he's getting an expanded role in Star Wars now. Yeah. I I, I wonder if it's the same voice out of all three of them. If they can harmonize, maybe. Um, (laughs) That's what they're going to do. We're going to name them Mo, Larry, and Curly. Like a little little Bob Shop choir or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Uh, didn't, didn't the, weren't there some uh, droid, the, the, the droids that were doing the Three Stooges antics in Jar or in Watto's shop, they were kind of modeled after the. I don't think they were actually named Curly, Larry, and Moe, but they were doing Stoogie, Stoogie stuff. Those. Well, the three uh, guys are in Mando are definitely like that, aren't they? I don't know. Oh, we, the there same, were spe- same yeah, same. I think some people were guessing that maybe those were the same pit droids that showed up in Mando because yeah. they were kind of. They had the, sort of the same personality. They are in uh, uh, Pelimoto's shop. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They are. So, it's, but it's canon. But uh, okay. It's canon. So, p- getting back to this photo, because I because yes, it, yeah. So yeah. Jude Law, um, it, it, he's in the foreground, but in the background you see the kids, and he's flanked. There's two on each side, and I would. It looks to me like at least two, maybe three, are human. But that one over mm. his left shoulder, his left, our right, uh, is it me or does that look like, uh, uh, what's the, uh, what, what's the blue, uh, the blue guy in, uh, that the, the, the looks like an elephant. Oh, Max Rebo. No, not Max Rebo. No, the one that's, <laughs> no, the one that's, the one that's hanging out with, with Palpatine. <laughs> The one that's hanging out with Palpatine, uh, not Massimita, the other guy, the fat guy. Uh-huh. Oh, you're talking about Orn Free Tom. Orn Free Tom, that's it. Yeah, well, he's a Twi'lek. He's a Twi'lek. Oh, and, he's and a so- Twi'lek. He, oh, he just looks, mm-hmm. he looks different. Anyway, well, this guy kind of yes. looks like maybe a, a fat Twi'lek. Perhaps. Let's see if because, I can zoom in know. here. That's the that best I can do. Oh, wait mm-hmm. a minute. Now I'm seeing buggy eyes. What if he's just overweight and you've been slamming him, you know? Oh, I know. Here come the letters. Here come we'll the letters. I wasn't wearing yeah, makeup. He's how I look. <laughs> he's the chunk <laughs> of... He's the yeah. chunk. He's going to do the uh, truffle the shuffle. Here, but, yeah, the rag right. but he's group. only in the... Now he's in Star Wars. But he's but definitely so, alien. It's going to be interesting to hear from Jude Law when it all drops because he's that guy is super geeky. I met him on Sherlock. And he was, he's got like, like super geeky tattoos. He's got like raw shark from the watchman is on his arm and stuff. Oh, no kidding. So he's, he's seriously into his comics and his sci-fi, I think. So he should be fun to talk to. Yeah. yeah. Well, Jude Law, and, and he's a pretty good actor. And uh, what do you think of his wardrobe? He's wearing a scarf and he, a tattered <laughs> jacket. What do you think of that? Is that Star Warsy too, Paul? <laughs> I'm scared because it's like you know what with the uh, what with the, <laughs> the 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 racer gang on Tatooine and you know all the zippers and buttons and what have you you know I'm like that looks suspiciously like a regular leather jacket and now I just think anything goes I mean we've had fishing waders and you know woolly jumpers <laughs> it's like I don't know what to think yeah you know it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me if it's up in a Nike top you know so I yeah. don't know <laughs> so. Okay, because you you have I mean you're 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 somewhat uh, uh, I don't want to say infamous 
because there's nothing infamous about Paul, but you're you're somewhat <laughs> famous. Notorious. No, 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 no. Notorious. You're, you're notorious. Saying, that's the that's word. Mm -hmm. Paul, you're somewhat <laughs> notorious for being um, very particular about things like that. And um, <laughs> nitpicky. Yeah, you're nitpicky. But look, you know your you know your stuff. You're 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 as, as far as the visual language of Star Wars, there's very few people that know it as well as you. But you're also an industry guy, and you've been in the mm. industry for a long time. And so give us the not the in universe explanation. Give us the industry explanation for why some of these details and things that you're these nits that you're picking. Why do you think they're going unnoticed? Because we're dealing with very sophisticated folks, big budgets, professionals, people who profess to really know Star Wars quite well. Um, what do you make of mm. it? I can only think it's probably two two things. Like, you know, there's the just the fact that it's a TV show, so we're talking about a lot more hours. There's a lot more to kind of keep track of. It's not like a movie every three years or something. So there's a lot going on. So there's probably, they have their hands full and it's probably harder to, you know, make sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted. But I think there's probably an element too of like, you know, you put the line where you want to. You know, people often <laughs> rip into me online and they kind of go, well, Luke Skywalker was wearing jeans in the first movie and, you know, and like maybe trousers are too earthly and they should stop wearing trousers and wear something else, you know, and it's like, okay. Yeah. I, get, I get the point that they've got somewhere there's got to be something earthy. <clears throat> but all I can tell you is, like, you know, when I, I remember chatting to Ralph Macquarie, obviously, at, like back years ago, and, and uh, as soon as you talked about anything like bricks or beams or anything kind of like super earthly, you know, his, his face would just, you know, cringe. And he, he clearly mm. did not think that was the idea, you know. So, but I mean, it's Star Wars has always been a team effort and they've always had to just kind of make do sometimes. And there are a lot of costumes in the original movie, you know, where they just pulled them off a rack and stuck yeah. them in the background. Uh, they were full, just regular army gear with buttons and stuff like that. But they kind of, you know, they made an effort to kind of put them out of the way. So really my only issue with it is the fact that if it ends up front and centre, then I kind of think, oh, come on, you know. Let's let's try and give the impression that it's the universe far far away, and you know, let's try. Like, there's these little things. I mean, it's funny because people, you know, have a problem with it because they kind of go, "Well, it's not that important and stuff." And I think, in one way, they're right, and in another way, it's like you know, these are these tiny little things are the things that make Star Wars feel really unique, you know. And if you just let it slide, it's like, well, if we're not careful, it can slip towards like Guardians of the Galaxy or any other sci-fi show. And I think maybe there's an element of that, you know, where you're bringing crews in from other projects and stuff, <clears throat> and they're just thinking, well, it's sci-fi, you know, it's futuristic. And, yet, you know, there will be people on the crew that need to be reminded this is historical and Star Wars isn't like all this other stuff, you know. So, you know, I don't, I, I, I think it would be naive, naive to assume that everybody knows what the score is, but you would think that this stuff would matter more maybe to, <laughs> to, to people. But then maybe that's my nerdy perspective you know and they're just not they don't care these are foundational elements that have been in place for four and a half decades and uh so a certain level yeah. of standards should be applied to maintain the integrity of it all i'd like to think so jimmy yeah it would be good wouldn't it you know it almost feels like they're phoning it in when they don't take the time and effort and the last thing we want is phoned in star wars well, it's weird. I mean, like, you know, the the uh, the thing about the bricks in Andor, which is daft, you know, but I know that Ralph would have hated that. He would have hated the bricks. You know, he really would have. Um, what would Ralph, well, well, you know, I know let, me, let me ask you, what do you think, bricks? I know it's hard to, to know for sure, but what do you think would have been potentially Ralph's solution to something like that? Is it the fact that they're calling them bricks? Is it the fact that they are <laughs> uh, rectangular? Would he have, you know beveled the edges I mean, I mean, what would have been like, ralph's yeah he would have looked for a way to make them different you know i mm. mean the reason why most of the houses in stores or most of the you know buildings in ralph's stores kind of either are things that are round you know because in his world you know in in, in berkeley there aren't a lot of <laughs> cylindrical buildings with kind of domey tops and stuff like that you know so for him that was quite an alien thing so he wasn't you know he he wouldn't put a regular roof on anything he wouldn't you know, I think he would make things out of stone. 
you know, big, big rocks and stuff like that that were carved like a pyramid or something. But bricks is was just a little bit too earthly. I, th- I think it's one of those things where he would have gone, okay, what if you had to, if you were an alien trying to imagine an earth brick, you'd probably get it wrong. So it'd be the, it'd be a different shape, it'd be a different size, it'd be a different colour all these different things that you could get wrong, you know, because you've never seen an earth brick before. So so for it to be exactly the same as a regular earth brick and, you know, stacked up the same way, I think for him would have really bothered him, hmm. you know, because they don't have hmm. ordinary door handles everywhere. They don't have ordinary light fittings, you know, that look like the fins we have here and stuff. You know, there's, they always just take it an inch further and make it strange and a bit stolesy, you know. So, yeah, so sure, don't sure. do that. I get what mm. you're saying, Paul, I mean, but I mean, people, also just to uh, to go back to my last comment, I said it, it feels like mm. they're phoning it in when uh, these these elements aren't acknowledged. However, in the case of Andor with the bricks, mm. that was yeah. a very interesting part of the story itself. How they would yeah. they would immortalize their dead with these bricks. So the yeah. bricks were actually a big mm. part of the story, and I think yeah. it's more effective. To think about dead people in typical everyday bricks <laughs> that we see everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But then they take it to I another level and they're like, oh, but there's there's remains in there, <laughs> you know, or, or ashes or whatever. Yeah. But I mean they'll make them black or toomey looking or you know. <laughs> yeah, but then but then that makes it different. That makes it too different. I, I like the idea of taking just mundane everyday mm-hmm. bricks and using them yeah. as a tomb for your loved ones. I, I yeah. think if you do anything, to make a different brick, then it's a different thing. Yeah. It's not a brick anymore and it loses its impact. Yeah. Um, and that's I only because of the storytelling element involved in this particular <laughs> example. Yeah. I mean, I think like it's, it's one of those things where like, like I mean, Tony Gilroy, he clearly is not, like Star Wars isn't necessarily his thing, even though he's brilliant at it, you know, when you consider he was involved in Rogue One and what have you as well. <clears throat> I loved Andor, but there were things about it that I didn't like. I felt like visually it was losing direction quite a lot. But there were there was stuff that I loved too. I mean, I like what they did with Coruscant, even though that large parts of it were shot at the Barbican, which is I used to hang out there because there are a lot of design yeah, agencies see, up that neck of the woods. That's so, gotta be hard on you, yeah. is that you're seeing familiar yeah. locations because they're shooting in England on location um, in well-known and established yeah. installations yep. and buildings and warehouses. And people are saying, Oh, I was there last week. And you're seeing um, Andor walking around and Mon Mothma was there and stuff. It's like, wow, you I were there. Did really, you see? I mean, it's, it's, it's more material. You know, the fact that it's pebble dash, it's very 70s and stuff like that in places. But in a way, I kind of like that. You know, that brutalism and stuff, I quite like it. And I think one of the reasons I used to hang out there is because it felt a bit Star Warsy. you know. <laughs> so in a way... You were location it, it scouting. Be, Paul's location yeah. <laughs> scouting. <laughs> Long before <laughs> there's even a project yeah. in the works. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess it's like that matter in, in on Tatooine, you know. I mean, that's a ho- it's a hotel, like, you know, City Driss and all that, and all they've done is slap a few extra little bits on it. So kind of that is the what they do, and so I suppose they should be able to do that anywhere they go. But <clears throat> And I think they did enough to Coruscant for it to just kind of work and, and feel good. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think it's a kind of like more of a collective thing. Like there were there were certain shots where I just kind of went, ooh, you know, where it, it looks like a Victorian factory. They're using normal chains, and there's a, there's somebody like hanging out in a hoodie with a logo on it. It's like all of a sudden there's a shot, and it you could know, be from any show. Paul, I, I got to tell you, as much as I loved Andor, and I did from a story perspective. Yeah. We had such a great time on the after shows discussing those episodes week after week. But even I, and I'm not, uh, I'm sort of the opposite of you in some ways, not not in opposition, <laughs> but I tend not to notice because I'm very much, yeah, a, I'm more of a story guy, character guy. And, um, but even I, yeah. there were a few times felt almost offended, <laughs> almost offended <laughs> by things like the hoodie and that, you know, when they were yeah. on that, that beach that resort planet, it was like Myrtle beach, uh, in star Wars. Oh, yeah. Uh, there were Post times where it was in your face it. It like, yeah. and you brought up Tony Regular Gilroy. Decades. Yeah. And you brought up Tony Gilroy. Yeah. And I think that's an important detail because yeah. this is a guy who as talented as he is 
and who gave us mm. a phenomenal arc and story. And uh, but but the guy just mm. doesn't really hold the same things that you kind of we do, and certainly you do in terms of the visuals. Not nearly as precious. I mean, it, it's all like uh, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's all afterthought. It seems like with him, and to the extent where. He's avoiding, and Jim and I, we, we, we made a big deal out of this. You know, he's avoiding uh, sorcery, uh, Jedi, Sith, and yet mm. in uh, Luthen's shop, it's full of these artifacts that point to the, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. <laughs> the mythology of Star Wars and the mysticism. And we think we just chalk it up to Tony just has no idea what those things are. I think he's just not into it. Yeah. Yeah, right. He's just not that into it. <laughs> But, you know, he's got a lot of opinions about, you know, what he wants in the story and, and what he doesn't. But but definitely I feel like the visuals, uh, those those details that you're talking about were, were missed. Now, there were some great, I think, visual effects, uh, I thought, in Andor. Um, you know, we talked about Luthen. I thought Luthen's ship was phenomenal. It was one of the best set pieces. And and even his shop. His shop was just full of those those Easter eggs. As a, as a props guy, as a designer... Um, what did you think of Luthen's shop and how it was populated with those Star Wars artifacts? I find, I find myself kind of really divided with this show where it's like there are things that I love and there are things that I don't love. And I'm glad they've made it, but there's just so, I guess there's just so much to do, isn't it? It's quite an ambitious show. So you've got a shop full of stuff. You've got, you know, <laughs> planet after planet. So I, I guess they can't make everything and they're going to end up throwing some stuff together. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it did seem pretty Jedi-centric Jedi, Jedi in the shop, didn't it, if nowhere else? Well, it certainly was the only place to actually see, you know, beyond a few mm. a few big set pieces like TIE Fighters. It was, certainly was the only place to see the most Star Wars-y or, or, you know, iconic uh, elements, and they were there as Easter eggs, which, you know, it, it is fine, but it didn't seem as though there was a lot of care taken in terms of avoiding things like, you know, the, the Sith holocron. Uh, I think there was a Jedi holocron in there too. You know, Padme's headdress. Um, what else uh, <laughs> showed up in there? Jedi temple <laughs> guard <laughs> helmet. Jedi temple guard helmet. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's a big one. Yeah. Gungan shield. There was right? like a, yeah, no blue shield, yeah. Yeah. Now little bits of everything, I think. Uh, didn't they have like Star Killer's mask as well or helmet, I think? Yes, yes. It was it, it was yeah, it yeah, was yeah. modified. It was modified, yeah, but yeah. It, it was the we same the it, looking mask and everything. Yeah. Mm. I still think, you know, you put this show up against uh, Kenobi and it, it looked a lot better. I think it felt like it had four times of production value. It's quite which was surprising. Okay. Yeah, so uh, so your take on Kenobi then is not as uh, favorable as oh, Andor, huh? I thought it felt cheap. I, th I it thought like cheap. it was really nice to see Ewan and Hayden. That was really good, and Ewan I thought like really delivered. But uh, I just thought it was really cheap. I thought the fight was like, oh my god, they're having a fight in a like a gravel pit somewhere <laughs> in North LA. You know, mm -hmm. after. Yeah. After waiting to see them reunited after decades, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know, I expected more than a gravel pit in L.A., you know. <laughs> well, I think they, yeah. they, they kind of made up for it there with the with the final confrontation that, that was a little bit more otherworldly. You know, you had the collapsing rocks on Kenobi. Um, and yeah. I thought, you know, it, it, that, of course, led to what I believe is was the money shot of that whole series which was Hayden mm. standing there with the with the helmet sliced and you know that incredible yeah. moment you know you didn't kill mm. Anakin Skywalker uh, how did that which is probably I think the climax really of that story how mm. did that resonate with you as a you know old school <laughs> old school fan from day one um I don't know. There was just something about the way the whole thing was directed that I felt was not quite working for me. And I think I think a lot of it was just that some of the visual stuff, I just thought that the choices were a bit strange. Like like Vader usually is shot from a little lower and there's a lot of just kind of like Vader walking around the corner like he's going to the shops, 
you know yeah it's kind of yeah. very, very ordinary for vader you know uh, okay. not quite as imp- impactful as you'd expect you know so i mean i could nitpick a lot of it visually and stuff like that and i don't i don't really want to pull the whole thing apart because i i wasn't a big fan of kenobi but it was just so nice to see like you and throwing his heart and soul into it and it was great to see to see him but I don't know. I just felt like so much of that was confusing. You know, I, I thought that the, the little kid didn't look like Luke at all. I thought that the girl who played Leia was fantastic, but shouldn't have been the focus of, you know, as much of a focus as she was. I, th- I think they had the hands full just like kind of doing justice to Kenobi and Vader. A lot of it I found confusing, like in terms of things like, um, you know, surely it's important that Kenobi doesn't get uh, get caught by the Empire and Luke doesn't get caught by the Empire, but he's picked out as the guy that needs to deal with everything. When, you know, uh, Leia's father, you know, is in charge of a whole planet. He's got thousands of men, probably, you know, at his disposal. Why does he need to send Kenobi, who's potentially the most vulnerable, to, you know, to rescue his daughter? It all seemed a bit, I don't know, it, it, none of it really made sense to me. <laughs> I yeah, don't know, you know, the way I, the way I, the way I... Uh, sort of approach that because I, I kind of thought that too it's like okay it's basically like in our country the secret service would be dispatched to you know to find leia yeah. but i think uh, if we got inside of bail organa's head he's probably ultra paranoid about if she fell in the wrong hands could they test her you know for midichlorians mm-hmm. could they in some way find out her secret uh who knows what testing they have so it's almost like he Mm. he's gonna just he he's gonna send the big guns in there because they literally the galaxy can't afford to have her sort of sniffed out Mm. for for what or who she really is that that was my my Mm. take on it but i had a similar you know initial impression as well Yeah, yeah that makes sense to me I, 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 that and the and the the new villain villainess, you know, that was I was confused about that. I couldn't really make sense of that. It's like so she's she's angry at Anakin for doing the exact same thing that she's about to do, like you know, killing loads of people, and she's been kind of working for him for twenty odd years or something, and not taking any opportunity to kill him, and now all of a sudden she's going to try and kill him. It was like, uh, yeah, I, you know. I, I, I'm with you on that. Like the, the the Reva stuff. Well, I, I can make sense of that. Me. I can make sense of that because she. It says in the in the show that she believes that she couldn't defeat Vader without the assistance of Obi Wan Kenobi. She's trying to recruit him to fight against Vader. That does happen in that that when they're talking to each other between the the blast door in that one episode. Why does she go and get Luke then? I don't. No, I'm I'm with you. The, the character of Reva is uh, <laughs> very confusing to me, and not even I can connect the dots. I can't even connect the dots. How she take a saber up through the gut? I've heard somebody explain to me her evil and hatred kept her alive, and I said, "Well, that doesn't make any sense at all." I mean, that is such a non-explanation. And they already wasted that on Darth Maul. They they wasted yeah. that whole is evil kept him alive, and it was believable with Maul. You know, it was yeah, because it was he's such a freak to begin with. Right, he's such a freak to begin with. Reva looks like you know <laughs> she could be a classmate of yours or something. Yeah, I feel as though the messages are kind of getting a bit diluted, but they've been getting diluted since the George's day. You know, because you kind of go after the special editions where all of a sudden Anakin's ghost comes back and he's like in his twenties. And Kenobi still like <laughs> whatever he is seventy something, and you think so. If you're a bad guy and you kill loads of people, you come back as a handsome twenty something, you know. Where mm. if you're a good Jedi, it's like tough. You're an oldie, you know. And then <laughs> oh, I got an answer for that. Sequel, I've got an answer for that yeah. one too. Okay, all right. Okay, okay. And then so the, the, all right, my go. my my thought with that is that it's reflective of the last time. You were uh, full of the light side, full of the light side of the force. Yeah. Then and still, the message is the same thing. You spend all eternity, like as a 20 year old, if you were a arse for <laughs> the rest of your life, and you just well, turn good at the that, end. Look, it, look, sometimes evil does pay. 
<laughs> and it's sort of a way to preserve your younger yeah. self for infinity. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think if we could, you know, if we had the ability to sort of go back and sort of uh -huh. <laughs> plot this stuff out, you know, yeah. uh, 40 years ago. <laughs> well, well, well. All I'm saying is, like, there's a lot of nag, -nag messages because you look in the sequels and it's like, date the date the mean guy, you know, <laughs> is is one of the latest messages. Date well, the trouble now guy you, you do know, know that the ladies love the bad boys. Yeah, but you know, it's not right. the message that George was trying to put out there. You know. No, you know, but, George. Here's the thing. You know, George is is a brilliant guy. Obviously, one of the one one of one of the best. But I will say this, and it was the Icons um, Unearthed documentary that really, I think, crystallized it to me, which uh -huh. is George is so, my take on it, is that George is so mm. unbelievably scarred and bitter and angry <laughs> about his marriage that I don't <laughs> think... He, movie. Yeah, I don't think he understands romance and conventional male female relationships at all <laughs> i don't i don't i don't, know, man. I don't think yeah, he does we what about melody and Hobbs? I, I don't know i'm not inside that marriage i don't know what the hell's going on there but i'm just saying that i don't think george can write right uh, uh -huh. you know because even you know even han and leia that was largely the the creation of the hayek's Kasdan, uh, that 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 uh -huh. that relationship wasn't you know George had the idea but he had the idea for a love triangle it was uh, you know that's kind of interesting I, when I think about George's writing mm -hmm. I I think he really does excel best at the pursuit of a relationship boy meets girl yeah. boy tries to get girl um, you see this in American Graffiti. Throughout the whole film, Richard Dreyfus is trying to meet Suzanne Somers. In Star Wars, Luke sees Leia immediately. You know, she's beautiful. You know, it's it's mm -hmm. it's always the pursuit. Anakin Skywalker, the going infatuation. After he really does get that the obsession. Infatuation. Yeah, yes, the, mm -hmm. it's the courtship stuff not, that he I mean, really. That's right, the stuff that he focuses in on. I absolutely adore. I know it's, we're kind of jumping around a bit, but it's been so long since we've talked Star Wars, guys. But but like those two Mando episodes of Boba Fett just blew me away. I loved seeing Luke like that. Like it was just amazing. I was chatting to a producer buddy of mine, and we were both just kind of going, "Right, now do Dark Empire," you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, Paul, I will tell you. So you you have been you have been ahead of two major major. Uh, moments in in star wars where you were the guy that was out there right. holding you kept the faith for episode seven eight. i was just telling a, a, a friend of <laughs> mine not that great. long ago um yeah. she was telling me what an x-files fan she was and i said you know oh, she yeah. thought because i'm a star wars guy that i wasn't into x-files and i said oh no i love x-files and you know uh before disney ever bought Lucasfilm. We had a gag on the show where we had the Malder poster. I want to believe it was episode seven, eight, yep. nine. Because Paul, you would come on the show, and almost every appearance, at some point, you would say, "Yeah, guys, I think it's really going to happen. I, it's going to happen at some point, mm -hmm. seven, eight, nine. Now we're not going to talk about what we thought about seven, eight, nine. You know, the, but 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 you kept the faith that it was going to happen. The other thing that you kept saying was going to happen was that we were going to get CG versions of original trilogy characters in their, you know, in the form of them the as, as young people in their prime. And uh, it, it was, there was a video game that was coming out. I remember you sent us all a screenshot. Yeah. And you go, this is what they're going to end up doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Battlefront. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. damned if you weren't right. Now we got a walking, talking, breathing Luke Skywalker, you know, circa 1983. Mm -hmm. I still think we're gonna get. I don't know, man. It's close. I, I think. I, I. I think it'd be insane to not do that time period straight after Return of the Jedi, because even though it's it kind of buffers up against Mando, 
I think those five years, you know, straight straight after the movies, if they do an animated show that's that's different, I think people are maybe ready for a, for a different style in terms of animation. As much as I'm enjoying Bad Batch and stuff like that, it's starting to feel about like a very very watered down Clone Wars. And I know there there are good people doing good work on it, but I can yeah. feel the scale of drinking. You know, you know, I got to tell but, you, as uh, far as Bad Batch goes, I, I was also talking to a friend at the day job on that one, and. Uh, uh, yeah. he, he, he came up to me and said, Hey man, I'm really excited for Mando starting next week, but Oh man, bad batch. Yeah. I'm five episodes in. I'm, I'm just, I, 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 it's hard for me to get through it. And and I just said, I think that it had, he, cause he said, I love season one so much and I'm not digging season two. Right. And I don't know what you guys think, but I wonder if Filoni might have been a little bit more involved in season one, at least mapping it out. Uh, yeah, then is season, season two. Yeah, is it is that it's is like, that possible? This this season, the best episodes have all been kind of finished up episodes of Clone Wars, haven't they? The 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 Wookiee app was literally because we saw we saw animatics of chunks of that episode sure. in the unfinished Clone Wars sort of stuff. So I think like when it feels bigger, it's because they're kind of building on stuff they've already done, you know. Yeah. So I don't know. I just. I don't know. I've never been the biggest clone fan anyway, really. I'm sorry, guys, but <laughs> clone fans out there. So, you know, I wasn't particularly excited about it being – what I liked the idea of was that, oh, they're going to do something like the Clone Wars and continue that story, which I think was the way to go. And I think there's – they're hinting that this show is going to be better than it appears at the minute with all the Mount Tantis stuff and all that. I feel like it could go somewhere really interesting, but right now I'm finding it a bit humdrum. You know, yeah, it's, it's just a little bit – yeah. Get to it, you know. Yeah, but mm. you know, I'm glad, um, it exists, I'm glad they're doing it. It gives us fresh Star Wars to talk about every week. Yeah, and uh, we, you know, fueled by stellar animation, and uh, mm. and that's good. That's good for me. Pretty. I do agree with you. Mm. I believe season two is meandering a little bit. I think there are bigger fish yeah. to fry, better stories to tell, and um, mm. this crew, the Bad Batch, they need to evolve into and and. Start doing something yeah. different. They need to get out of their routine, which is unfortunately become humdrum. Mm. I, I think even the yeah. characters themselves are feeling it a little bit, and they're cartoons. Yeah. So I am looking mm. forward to Mandalorian coming back to giving us some real meat on the bone. But I have to say that even with the the adventure of the week format and stuff. Man, we've been getting a lot of mileage out of our Bad Batch after show conversations. Those conversations we've been having with our audience, with our live callers, it's just really, it's enhanced season two so much. Yeah, for yeah I don't know. And that really became very apparent this week. I I, I'm, I'm with you. And, and I, I said, I said uh, to, to my friend, I said, watch the, watch the after shows because it really does add because it does for me, and I'm not. This isn't just you know uh, pointless uh, promotion. I'm just saying, Max, exactly right that it's making this series, uh, this season, a lot more interesting and fun for me because we're sort of crowdsourcing the um, the nuance of the storytelling, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, we're crowdsourcing it with our with our audience, so we we are having a lot of fun. Um, but it's. It, I, we're did, hoping it did goes. You get a lot of, did you get a lot of reaction back about visions? Did people like it? You think it came and went? It, 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 it came yeah. and went, just like the that. Um, is, is, is do you think there's a market still in this day and age for like quality two D animation in the Star Wars world? And the reason why I say that is because when when you think back to thing like things like droids, is as simplistic and 80s as they were compared to something as sophisticated as Clone Wars or, or uh, Bad Batch. At the same time, they've got different, you know, 3D has different limitations. You know, building all the assets can be expensive. Sure. Um, so as much as it speeds things up in terms of kind of animating in a 3D environment and all that kind of stuff, <clears throat> you know, in 2D, I mean, literally whatever they feel like drawing, they can draw. So that it can be quite expansive and really, you know, tell tell big stories like we used to get in the Clone Wars, even though, even though 
it's not got the same vibe. I just don't know if there's really the same market for it. I don't know if kids would go for it these days. You know, I'm not sure well, if there's much it, in the audience. The kids thing, so? it's unfortunate. Here's, here's the real mystery of all of this, is that when they do create 2D animated productions, they specifically yeah. gear it toward little kids. They, I, I don't know if they just think because... The production process is simpler, thus the content contained within should be simplistic as well. I don't know why they do that. I think 2D animation would be greater embraced by older fans who actually grew up with 2D animation. Now, I think Star Wars has hit a gold mine with their animation techniques employed in shows like The Clone Wars, Tales of the Jedi, and The Bad Batch. And I think that's the way to go. Uh, but, yeah. you know, maybe not limit that type of animation style to that particular mm-hmm. era on the timeline. Spread it out a little bit more. Maybe give us an, a yeah. Mandalorian animated series at some point or something like that. You know, there, there are things you can do, places you can go. Take Rangers of the New Republic. Mm. You can still have Cara yeah. Dune in that show, create an animated show yeah. around all of that research yeah. and, and development for that series. Just get a different yeah. voice actor for Cara Dune. Easy peasy. Mm. <laughs> mm. You know? Why, why do yeah, I have I'll- to be here on the podcast thinking of all of this stuff? I don't get paid <laughs> enough to be coming I, up know, with all of these been. incredibly great I ideas. Mean- You know, you're talking about predictions, uh, Jason. Uh, Here's my prediction for Indiana Jones, if you want to hear that, even though it's off at a tangent, but with it being... Still Lucasfilm, it's sort of a cousin to Star Wars. Yeah, well, you know, there are all these rumors about it involving time travel, and all all we're hearing at the moment is, no, 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 all the the, the scenes of India as a young India are just in the opening shots, and it's just a flashback, and so maybe that's the case. But, you know, there have been leaks of pictures of, like, Greek warriors, uh, like Hoppite warriors and, and Romans and things like that. So there's clearly a moment that's either a flashback or or there actually is a time travel moment. And if you look at the, the, the trailer, there's a shot that looks like he's in the Falcon. They're in the cockpit of something and it's like zooming along. And at one time, there were a lot of rumors about the, the Nazis having a time machine. And uh, that mm-hmm. basically that's that's plays a large part in the Dial of Destiny. So my my thought was like, if this is the last film that Harrison's going to do for Indy, what if they're just setting this whole thing up so that Indy's basically lost in time or is in time somewhere, and they're basically kind of building Indy out as a, as a character that they can carry on in an animated show where he gets the Doctor Who treatment and it's Indiana Jones traveling through time? Because for me, that seems like a story that would be... A no-brainer for kids, like, and George would like it because George always wanted Indy to be a bit of a history lesson. But with this, he could expand it what into a larger time. Idea. You know, yeah. go, well, you could go Doctor away, Who, but, or as we yeah. call it here in the states, Paul, uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent uh, Adventure. That's that's <laughs> our equivalent of yeah. Doctor Who. Um, <laughs> they're in the, the telephone budget, yeah. booth, and they no, um, no. What a great idea! It, it's almost like a where in the world is Carmen San Diego, but it's like where in time is Indiana uh, Jones? Um, yeah, once you see through time, you know, as they go back to kill the dinosaurs or whatever, you know, you get. Indy, I, I would go love back it. And, I would absolutely love it. What, if, what if I'd love for a two D uh, Indiana Jones animated series? Yeah. I'd love for that to be kind of an yeah. old school throwback. What if Indiana yeah, Jones? Is- acquires a time machine and he goes Mm. back in time to a long time ago to a galaxy far, (laughs) far away. And he gets stuck there and he's, he's, he's still pretty young and he gets stuck there (laughs) and he can't get back. So he, Mm -hmm. he ceases to be Henry Jones Jr. And becomes Han (laughs) Solo. I like it. It works for me. And then the rest is history. Something like that. Where where Indy... Was there a a comic book? Or something? It was Star Wars Tales. There was a Star Wars Tales. Yeah, that's the one. That... It was similar to that. I don't know if it was exactly the way I just laid it no, out, not, but uh, not, as, not as good as what you came up with it, with Jimmy. But like now, because I know it ended up with Chewbacca being kind of Bigfoot or something, didn't it? Wandering into the hills. <laughs> there was some, yeah. yeah. There was some weird thing like that that was happening. So, yeah. hey, Paul. Um, before we let you go, and by the way, this has been so much fun to chat with you. It's been far too long. We cannot let it go 
this long. We've no. got a new season of Mando, so we want to check in with you oh, wow. um, with, uh, with that. Um, but mm. it's right around the corner, a Star Wars celebration, London. I know that mm. when I w- look, you are so beloved by Rebel Force Radio listeners and watchers. Of course, mm. many of them thought when they heard Celebration was going to London, yes, Paul Bateman, Star mm. Wars Celebration. But my understanding uh, is that you you're not going to be attending the the show this year. Yeah, I was, I'll make it this year. I don't think. No, yeah. it's a bit of a trick. Mm, yeah, unfortunately, I can't leave for Athena on her own. That's basically the short short version of the story. So yeah, um, well, yeah, of course, I can't. I, family I can't and love go, comes first. But yeah, I did yeah, want yeah, I did want everyone to hear it from you rather than us just saying, "Hey, we've heard that Paul uh, won't be able to be there. Yeah, We're not going to be able to be there." Yeah, I mean, I was hoping is you know I could get get up and see as many people as possible. I know a few people bought tickets hoping they were going to bump into me and stuff. So it was like, oh, you know. But um, yeah. we're currently like quite a few hours away from London, so it's quite a trick for us to get up there. You know, at the moment. Sure. So uh, yeah, gonna have to skip it this time. But uh, I can't believe they're not they're not going to have one next year, are they? They're going to wait until twenty five, yeah, right? Wait until twenty five, and uh, I know uh, <clears throat> Jim had a theory about why. <laughs> Yeah, obviously yeah. that's that's they're targeting a film release in December 2025, so they want to save yeah. the hype for for the theaters. Uh-huh. Yeah, so everything will be tied into that. It will be. Um, they're going to make a big splash of it. On they're going to go 2025, coming to the theaters, episode 10. Yuzan Vong. Yeah. <laughs> <Woo! laughs> be it. Can't go wrong with the Yuzan Vong. <laughs> Um, That's what the name of the it's going to be called. Uh, you know. <laughs> you say. Lastly, though, I do want to I do want to ask because um, you know you are a details oriented guy, and you do you you know so and, nice to me, Jason. No, you, you, no, you can say it. You're like <laughs> no, no, really no, no, nitpicky, no. annoying. No, 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 no. So anal. You're, you're a detail oriented guy, and a lot of this is informed <laughs> by what you've you know, what you do for a living and, and all of that, Mm. obviously, you know, given your, your long history with uh, helping to preserve and promote the legacy of, of Ralph McQuarrie, all of that. Um, But there are, there are people that are concerned. They're, they're, they're wondering like, is, is, is Paul not into star Wars anymore? Um, (laughs) So what is the status of your fandom? And is it something that's in need of repair? And how and how can it be repaired? Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you what it is for me. is like I don't want to show up at a party and spoil anybody's good time, you know. So if everybody's having a good time, I don't want to be the guy that's rolling up and moaning about zippers, you know. <laughs> but um, I... I, I was so disappointed with the sequels, and it took me a long time to realise just how disappointed, you know. So... It's one of those things where a lot of conversation tends to, even now, tends to sort of like revolve around that. And I just don't see them as real Star Wars movies, you know. I look mm-hmm. at it, I've come, I've come to look on it less, in a less annoyed kind of attitude. And it's more about, okay, this is like a cover band. It's like a band that shows up and kind of plays ABBA numbers, but they're not actually ABBA. So if they brought an album out, you know, we shouldn't all be going crazy because it's like, look, a new ABBA movie! You know, or a new mm. other album, it's because it's not really them, you know. So I think I'm trying to adjust my expectations. I, th- I feel like I was expecting something that was exactly what George would make on a lot of levels. And the fact that it's not that, I think I should have really seen that coming. You know, I should have been less naive and, and not expected as much as I expected. But um, I don't know. There's still wonderful stuff in there. I feel like, I feel like, we're in good hands with Dave and, and John. I feel like Dave gets it on a level that is probably beyond all the rest of us. Cause you know, he spent all that time with George and everything talking to him yeah. about the ins and outs. <clears throat> um, so I'm really excited about everything that he and, and uh, Favreau do. I think that they, they, they're making authentic, realistic, fantastic Star Wars. And whenever they're heavily involved, I think we're in good hands. <clears throat> and I look at the, the Boba Fett has been very close, you know, apart from a couple of things I didn't like. I, I, I enjoyed, like, all the stuff with the Rancor I thought was great. It was nicely Danny Trejo in there. I loved it. it was, I yeah. liked Tatooine and all that stuff. 
I know some people are sick of it of, of Tatooine, but I, I can't get enough of it really. So it, it all works for me. But the only thing I didn't like about that show really was the speeder bike gang, and the fact that I felt Boba was a bit upbeat and a bit happy, you know. So mm. I felt the character was a misfire. But, but otherwise, like I mean, that sounds like a lot. But otherwise, I had a good time watching Boba Fett. So yeah. I don't know. I kind of feel like my my fandom is like where before I think I used to be like I love it all. I, you know, I could even like droids and Ewoks for goodness sake. So mm-hmm. you think I'd be able to embrace the new stuff a little more readily given that, you know, but I think knowing that George was overlooking at everything, I kind of like, I, f- I feel like that was, that was my reason for so often just kind of approving of everything kind of going, okay, this is not for me, but that's all right because George is still steering the ship. And now he's not, I, it's just far easier to kind of go, George wouldn't do that. Or that's not, you know, that's doesn't feel like it fits what George had done. But um, I don't know. I'm getting used to it, and I, f- I feel like there will be other shows, you know, that I'm going to enjoy and stuff like that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Ahsoka, mm. and I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, anything that Dave and Dave and John have a hand on. And I think they will gradually figure it out. I think I think they'll, if they pay attention to what what's popular, you know, then I think we're gradually going to get better and better stars. I think the only thing that's important is I think it's important for fandom to not just arbitrarily like everything because it's stars. You know, you so often I hear people say, um, you know, I love it all. And I think that's kind of naive. It's like, uh, you know, it's undiscerning. It's like every every band puts out a bad album, you know, and I think sure. you should call it out. You don't need to moan sure. about it all the time or anything, like I tend to, but, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where I think um, – I, th- I think people need to to be, you know, a bit more honest about what they think. And Disney, I think, certainly needs to pay more attention to how the audience is reacting and stop being so dismissive of how people feel, because that's a yeah. kind of a bit of a turn off for me, fan. You know, I, th- I think I want I want the fans to be treated with respect on both sides of the fence. If you love it or you hate it, it should have equal credence with the company that's making things. They should kind of go, "That's interesting," rather than go, they go kind of go, "All those people, the enemy." You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I'm, I, I'm with you there. Uh, okay, so Paul, you're either our Star Wars Nostradamus or our our Magic Eight Ball, and I imagine you're our Magic Eight Ball. I'm going to shake you, and I'm going to ask you one question, Paul. <laughs> okay, I, so I'm actually shaking, shaking your head. The ball. I'm shaking Paul's head. <laughs> Paul, will George Paul's Lucas will George Lucas right. ever write, direct, or steer a Star Wars story again? Paul Bateman says. Oh, Oh my God. Um, No. He says no. I think he's, I think he's, I think he's not unless, not unless the brand ever gets sold. I can't see that happening. I think think he's old and and he's relaxed. He's chilling. He's got a kid. I think, I think now it's become something that's not his. So I think stepping into it would be really weird for him unless he got a chance to kind of like, basically clear the deck it would be like a do you get did you used to have like the etch a sketch thing in the u.s yeah. i don't know if you did oh yeah we had mm-hmm. a sketch. I, yeah. mm-hmm. I think that's what he'd want to do he'd want to kind of like just like what's all this you know i think he'd want to shake it and start again shake it up you know i think that's there's think that's there's such a part should. of me that just fantasizes about george directing like a two or three part arc of mandalorian or something like that or co-writing it with dave and john i just I don't know why, uh, but I, I'm with you. When you when when I heard you talking about, you know, there was a point in your fandom when George was steering the whole was steering the ship, that it gave you this sense of everything was going to be okay, or it was okay to like everything, or whatever, however it was that you put it. Yeah. And I was just mm. thinking, like, how great would it be just to have George and Dave working together mm. again? Nah, um, he's done. He's toast. I mean, if George was working on other things, then I'd say, yeah, there's a possibility. But George doesn't work. Yeah. He's, he he yeah. doesn't work. Right. I heard George say in 2009, I saw George at the Four Seasons in Chicago, and he said, the reason I developed all this technology and stuff is because I'm lazy. I want the easiest way to get things done. Right. I think yeah. he embraces laziness, quite honestly. Uh, he's a guy who, who likes to chill. He likes to live the good life. He likes to spend <laughs> his money and enjoy himself. And plus, he's got a little kid at home again. Yeah. So what are we going to get? More Jar Jar Binks fart jokes? I mean, come on. <laughs> I, have, right. 
I used to dream about them making sequels and stuff. My dream now is that one day I'll be able to go into a bookshop and pick up uh, a giant, you know, leather bound black volume, with silver writing on it that says Star Wars episodes seven, eight and nine. And it says by George Lucas at the bottom mm-hmm. that will eventually they'll put out George's version because once they've kind of got past the whole ego thing of, no, you're supposed to like ours. Ours is as good as George's or better because George's sequels are rubbish. We're better at creating Star Wars than he was, you know, lose the ego thing and just kind of go, people really, really, really want to know what he had in mind for good or bad. I mean, it might be terrible for all we know. Right. But right. like, mm. we know, still want to know, we though, want right? To- we really want to know. I don't know. I think it'd be a leather bound pamphlet. I don't think it was fleshed <laughs> out enough to fill out more than 30 to like 50 did- pages tops. <laughs> and then you'd have to have somebody else fill in all the blanks. Because it wasn't it wasn't a fully developed thing. He did hire Michael Arndt, and they threw out Michael Arndt stuff. So that's probably the closest you'll get to George Lucas's Episode Seven. Is his, you need the Michael Arndt script? Mm. That's the one they threw away. That Michael Arndt is the guy that George handpicked and hired, and then he was fired by J.J. Abrams and Kathleen Kennedy when they rebooted think- everything. Abrams and Lawrence Kasdan took over the script from that point. If Star Wars, you know, is, you know, because it's, it's clear that, you know, Star Wars figures and Star Wars spaceships that were created in the 70s, like X-Wings and Darth Vader, still fly off the shelves. And, like, almost everything that was created for the sequel trilogy is gathering dust, you know. Yeah. So yeah, there was oh, something, yeah. And I'm not saying that to knock what's around. I'm, I'm what, you know, I'm leaning into, like, let's, there's something of value in George's work, even the bad stuff, you know. And I think, like... If that if they really want to make a ton of money, I'm telling you right now, like there's, I know every book gets bought onto the the New York Times bestsellers list these days, you know. But like, if if they brought out George's sequels as a book, that thing would sell buckets. You know, people would just everybody would be talking about it. It would be everywhere. The, you know, people would just mm. be crazy about. I'm surprised he hasn't done it. Honestly, I don't know that he can. I, there was a loophole that allowed him to release or to work with the uh, with Marvel on that uh, the, the yeah. Journal of the Wills or whatever that was. That, that was, his that was not a loophole, and that wasn't Marvel. That was Dark Horse, and that was J.W. Rensler who got George Lucas's approval to work with Dark Horse to make that happen. Wasn't but that, that was all post, based on George's that rough draft. Disney sale? No, that was that was toward the end, Jason. You're right on with uh, the timeline that yeah. but that was still when George owned and ran Star Wars. Okay. All right. And that I, was a I Rinsler thought that it thing. was uh yeah, now that you say that, I do recall it being Dark Horse, the end towards the end of the Dark Horse run. Uh, yeah, I think the Dark Horse Star Wars. Yeah, right, the Star Wars. <laughs> I think a lot of where I, where I come from too is like I look back at like I mean I had friends over here who were very very much into the EU in a way and I've always been into EU, EU a bit and I've you know I've heard all the audio books read most of the books but I've never been like particularly like they can't get rid of it and in fact when they were doing that I thought it was probably a wise idea to sort of clear the deck and start anew but but you know um, given where we are now you know I kind of think it's it's quite clear that a lot of people mm-hmm. still have a lot of fondness for the older stuff. So for me, I think like it's one of those things where it feels like there's still value in that Legends material, you know. They keep I, reprinting it and putting it back on sale as ex- paperbacks. So. That's exactly. In fact, I was just at a Target recently, and mm. I couldn't believe how much Legends material mm. was on the shelves. And, yeah. and you know, it's not like Target's a library. Uh, Target has a lot of you know new material, yeah. but man, oh man, the Star Wars section was largely Legends material. It, probably <laughs> more Legends heard, material than it was anything else. I don't know if there's any truth to this or not, so somebody will have to back this up with statistics because it's just word of mouth. So this could be complete rubbish. But the only thing I heard was that if you go back to the – I know that this was a bit of a uh, unusual um, situation in that when Air to Empire first came out, obviously it was massive because it was the first new – material that we'd had to do with Star Wars in many, many years, you know, that that all of a sudden we've got this brand new haul back and everything. But I'd heard that the sales for that are like exceeding the sales of like 50 of the new books, like together, you know, combined. If you look at the actual numbers of, of, of sales of this stuff. 
So you, it's clear that, you know, something is lacking in a lot of the modern fiction when you compare oh, it to the attention it was getting. But. Yeah, I, I think there is no question. Uh, if you just follow what's been happening with Hasbro, um, which is yeah. probably one of the top licensees, I, I can't speak specifically about the books, but I followed the Hasbro stuff and, and I know exactly what sells and what doesn't in terms of the, yeah. uh, the merchandise and it's it's all classic characters because it's nostalgia driven like, largely I, but, I mean i feel like a lot of what I, when i'm talking about this stuff it tends to turn into me just having a moan about what's out there but really what i'm getting at is this frustration because i feel like there is stuff out there that's wonderful and even though i wouldn't be the largest trumpeter for for like the eu i still think well why not o open up and you know you look at things like the marvel kind of what if think mm -hmm. why couldn't we have a 2d animated show that's just basically let's have shadows of the empire one week let's have air to empire another week let's i mean anything you want you know any you could of, have any a, you books. could have an anthology just series that just yeah. called legends and to your point yeah. the 2d animated Legend versions show. of some of those mm. it'd be awesome it just would be awesome out and see, you know. yeah mm. it's too that's yeah. too simple of a of a uh, an idea i mean it's too sensible of an idea for it to ever actually happen <laughs> of course because what's going on the people at lucasfilm they 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 inherited george lucas's empire and they get so paralyzed and so they get crushed under the weight of the this creation all the time they're afraid to pull the trigger on anything Mm -hmm. uh, especially if it came to something like that, like actually giving the fans what they want. And you were talking about novel mm -hmm. sales. I heard from a source uh, that Del Rey has been really frustrated with Lucasfilm about the mm -hmm. way that things are going with the books because the story group controls all of that stuff when it comes to publications. Mm -hmm. And uh, Del Rey thinks that there's been too much effort writing for those who really aren't in the Star Wars fan base. And I don't know if this mm. they're trying to to overcompensate to win a larger audience. I don't know why they have to. It seems like Star Wars the Star Wars fan base is plenty large enough, but it's always like <laughs> trying to attract someone from outside of their uh, yeah. their P1 demo is what we call it in advertising. <laughs> and um, yeah. so the opinion of of people who have these publishing licensees Star Wars has to come back to what the fans want for it to be profitable. Companies like Del Rey have sent requests to Lucasfilm to change to what the fans really desire, but but mm -hmm. th there 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 are issues. There are issues, as you could imagine. There's yeah. there's there's power mm -hmm. struggles. There's political issues. There's all kind of things going on here, yeah. which was which is unfortunate because under George Lucas's stewardship, all of that stuff was kind of filtered out, and it yeah, came yeah. down to just George. You know, the he on his desk he had a sign probably. It said the buck stops here, or the credits guess, or whatever. If he wants to stay in universe. Is. I guess the question is how do we how do how do they get this back into a state where they can have more hits and misses and kind of like start consistently putting out stuff that most people like because that's not where we're at right now. I mean, like no, we're far speaking, from it. They got a lot of the wrong voices at the table. Wrong voices at the table yeah. at Lucasfilm, <laughs> and these people have been there for some of them 10, 15 years. Something has yeah. to be done. Something needs to be but done. Like, they need uh, what, Lucasfilm you know, needs an enema. They have to flush out all this <laughs> crap and put people I mean, I, in there who actually in, well, know they what they're doing. Them. Yeah, they have to stop. I mean, I'm not the, interested in knocking it or, uh, or or just slamming them. You know, like I want them to succeed. You know, so oh, yeah. and, uh, I want those that we yeah, all I, can I, love. You know, I also think that they don't. I, I don't think that they understand sort of uh, mainstream Star Wars fans. I think they understand Fringe, um, and I just don't think they know where the sweet spot is. It's kind anymore. of one and the same, isn't it, really? You know, we're the same people, you know. I mean, it's, I think they make it more complicated than they need to, you know. I think yes. I think it's probably simpler than it than it seems to them. You know, yes. I, 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 but I think that there's an element. I think there's an element of Star Wars fandom that is not interested in traditional storytelling. I think there's an element of Star mm. Wars fandom, and I do think that it's a minority. But I do think that they they want 
they want to tune into Star Wars and they want to see kind of what they saw or what was seen with uh, original 60s Star Trek, where it's the the uh, the uh, issue of the week, issue of the month, tackled in the Star Wars universe. Have you been watching Star Trek Picard lately? Have you have you seen the season? I, I saw the, the first second episode. episode. Just saw the uh, just saw the first one and uh, seems like. Well, you know, I mean. I haven't enjoyed any of the Trek from about 2000 and whenever it is, six yeah. up to the present day. I have not enjoyed it at all. And then all of a sudden, it's like there's been a U-turn. But it, it's it, it's like um, it's been doubly nice for me because a friend friend of mine is actually in the captain's chair in uh, Picard, uh, Todd Stashrick. Oh, is so that he's, right? he's, he's the new, oh. Yeah, he's the new captain. Yeah, he's, he's a, a mate of yours. Oh, that's great. And, he's, and he's, a, he's a great guy, and he's one of us. He's a proper geek. He's, his house is full of stuff. And he's as big into Star Wars as he is into Star Trek. And his friend, uh, Terry Matlas, is the, is the showrunner. Right. And he's been a ter- television writer for years. He did, like, 12 Monkeys, and uh, he's worked on various different, like, Trek shows now and again before. But I think like, because everybody just backed off and let him do his own thing in this season, all of a sudden the quality is, like, quadrupled. It's like the story's yeah. better. It feels like real Trek. They're, they're even doing things like there. There are like little visual nods that I pick up on, like the you know the the fonts and the the color of the writing is like the movies and the sweet spot around the eighties, you know. So it's like all the early you know Rathacon movies. It's got that kind of a vibe to it, and uh, the plotting is suddenly loads better. The characters are loads better. It's it's just it's just working firing on all cylinders. And it's just primarily down to the fact that there's one guy who understands what Trek is and, it, and is 100% into the, the, the chunk that 95% of Star Trek fans think is the peak of Trek. So he's trying to kind of like channel that and just bring it back in a new way. And it's succeeding. And it's sad, really, because I think Picard, this is probably going to be the last season, but it's taken three seasons for him to get it together because Terry wasn't in the, in, the, in the top chair. And now he's managing to kind of make something worth watching whereas before it was just i don't know it was really lost its way yeah <laughs> i think like still you know it needs that it needs and i think i actually made a comment online where i said like terry's done what we call in the stars community is he's, he's pulled a, a day feloni because <laughs> yeah. he's a guy that knows the material and they've let him do it you know and i think i don't know how we how they do it but i think it's it should be clear to anybody that that dave and john are managing to get you know, real Star Wars to happen. They're they're doing it. You know, and I, they are. You know, I think I they think. Are. How do we get their imprint on everything, or at least their filter? It's like we need to clone them or something, don't we? You know. <laughs> well, I think that they're. Well, I, I think it's going to become. Look, the, the the more mm. the more the more non Filoni Favreau stuff that is that comes out and does less than mm. what the Favreau Filoni stuff yeah. that that's going to speak volumes. I actually think that Bob yeah. Iger is a big fan of the Filoni Favreau. I think he's aware of who they are, what they're what they're putting Good. out. So I think he's <laughs> likely going to be um, looking very favorably on them and their efforts, and hopefully giving them more you of think, a voice. I mean, because I mean, it's been nearly what ten years or something since they've been involved, and I, I just kind of feel like the the ship is taking so long to turn. That it's like, is are they really getting it? You know, yeah. Well, I, I we're not know. waiting. I, I, we're I, not waiting for that little Lucasfilm motorboat to spin. We're waiting for the whole Disney uh, yeah. company to spin. Mm-hmm. I think that's the difference. Yeah. I think we're in yeah. a different era now. I think we really are. I, I mean, um, when uh, George sold to Iger, uh, Disney was growing and hitting on all cylinders, and then Bob yeah. winded down his reign. And uh, the pandemic hit, and his successor Chapik uh, really uh, yeah. drove the like he, he drove the ship ashore, and so now Iger's back, and he's looking at a different approach, a different way to go about this after the massive spending spree yeah. he led during his first reign. Mm-hmm. So I think that you can look at it; it's almost compartmentalized into three different eras. Mm-hmm since Disney has acquired Lucasfilm. And now we're in the third era, or phase three for you Marvel fans. 
But here we are, and it's going to be really interesting how things unfold. I think Iger is really going to push toward the the franchises that have a proven track record, and that would include Star Wars, and that's where a lion's share of the resources are going to go toward, and hopefully it will be with an eye toward quality and getting people in there who really understand storytelling and they understand Star Wars. Amen. Do you think do you think they push for, for John and Dave to, to do a movie at any point oh, to it, direct it, a movie? They have to. They have to make a movie. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense for them not to. They're the best guys with their fingerprints on Star Wars nowadays. And you can tell yeah. the difference. Uh, you know, also, Tony yeah. Gilroy is also great at what he does in his corner of the Star Wars mm-hmm. universe. You can tell the difference. Mm-hmm. There's two series, live action series, that have been released by Lucasfilm that did not have Gilroy or the favreau Filoni duo. And that's mm-hmm. Kenobi and that's mm-hmm. Willow. Both which had uh, with producer credits from Kathleen Kennedy and Michelle Rajwan. And I think it shows. Yeah. <laughs> I think That's it shows. Like There's a difference in quality. Let's face it. Mm-hmm. And then, How you know, you have Book of Boba yeah. Fett, but that was still a Favreau Filoni. Well, I think they were still involved yeah. in that. I, I, uh, what little information, and that's the thing, we just don't know what little information yeah. we can glean from some of the trackers that, that try to follow these these numbers uh willow mm. does not appear to be doing well or have done well i love warwick but i got two episodes in and i just dialed out i was like yeah, yeah. that's not for me yeah. yep you know uh, yep. and that's fine i mean you know, mac watched it so we didn't have to mac watched them all so that yeah i still haven't seen the season finale yet I can't bring myself to do it because I realized I was hate watching the show. I was sitting there hate watching it for bad acting. And I didn't hate all the acting, but some of the acting in that show is just absolutely atrocious. So I'm like, well, dude, you're hate watching. That's you. You have to stop hate watching. That's not good for anyone, but I do need to finish seeing the, the yeah. series. And it was a, a series that felt like it would be more comfortable on the CW network. And there's never been anything or released the on the CW network that appeals to me yet. I am still a huge mm. Superman fan. Mm. I love DC stuff, you know, but there's yeah. nothing that ever appealed to me that appeared on CW. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, mm. it's the same vibe, you know, it's the same vibe. I can still be a fan and not care for Mm. CW network quality programming. It's a peculiar time to be in, isn't it? Where like you can't criticize something without getting slammed. And it's like, it's like people have have lost track of the fact that like, we actually really, really want to love it. You know? Yeah. Like I'm not intentionally hating anything. Right. Here's the problem though, Paul. I think this is the problem Mm. is that some, Mm. there are some out there who have made a cottage industry of hating stuff and Mm. and they have ruined it for guys like you who critical thinking they've destroyed critical thinking because now any sort of critical (laughs) thought becomes hate Mm. infused right and that's Mm. not part of the recipe folks it isn't Mm. but for some like jason said they've cultivated their entire livelihood around rooting for star wars to fail and that's one thing we don't ever do here on Rebel Force Radio is root for Star Wars to fail. No, we want mm. it to succeed. All right, Paul, we got to wrap it up here, man. Uh, we've got, uh, well, Mac and I are from here. It's just after shows for the next month as we go yeah. into Mando season three and uh, wrap up uh, Bad Ooh. Batch season two. So uh, let's not wait no. so long to do this again. Okay. So uh, Any promise problem. that you'll check Any in with problem. us. Uh, you know, certainly Absolutely. we want to hear how, you, how you're liking uh, Mando season three for sure. I'm sure I'm going to love it because I'll just adore the last two seasons. And the, and the two Mando apps of Boba Fett were amazing. Yeah. I loved them. All right, man. And where, so just as a reminder, uh, where can people find more Paul Bateman talking about Star Wars and all kinds of other things? Uh, I know Facebook is a great way. Uh, yeah, we're on, uh, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I'm trying to think what my Twitter address is. It's, uh, uh at Paul RMQ at Paul RMQ. 
long queue. That's one you can find me on there normally ranting about something or other. Yeah, but, right. uh, yeah or on Facebook, hunt me down on Facebook. I'm probably if you put like you know RFR and Paul Bateman, you'll find me. All right. So eventually. well, we we love you and all our best to Athena, and uh, Thanks, hope to dude. talk to you again very hey, soon. Look, all right. One quick passing shot, like just to say to everybody, I'm sorry, it's been a long time since I've been on everybody, and I'm sorry if this episode turned into me moaning about everything. But uh, I'm optimistic about the future, and if Dave and John are attached to it, I'm I'm going to be there right from the first minute a thing drops, and I'm probably going to love it. All right. So Thanks so much, Paul. All right, guys. Take care, buddy. Talk Thanks, soon. Paul. All right. Bye-bye. Take it easy, buddy. Chewy, get us out of here! All right, that's going to wrap things up for us, uh, not just for this week, but for the next few weeks. As uh, the weekly Rebel Force Radio show takes a little hiatus as we focus all efforts on covering Mandalorian Season 3 and the rest of Bad Batch Season 2 for the month of March. RFR, uh, the weekly RFR, will return in April. In the meantime, if you're looking for more Rebel Force Radio, there's a great way to... uh, Get more RFR in your life, and that's through Patreon. That's right. You heard earlier in the program, brand new tier RFR Insider, $2 a month. Check that out. Just go to rebelforceradio.com, click on the Patreon banner, and all those details can be found there. It's the weekly full show video that you'll get, in addition to exclusive podcasts that you can't get anywhere else, and just a fabulous community of Star Wars fans. Available to uh, talk to, commune with. And uh, also, don't forget about getting to the head of the line on those after shows. we got two a week coming up. So if you want to uh, make sure that your opinions, your thoughts, your observations get heard, uh, no better way to do that than becoming a member of our supporters at Patreon. Uh, also, please watch us on YouTube. That's right, youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio. Uh, we've got just, well, we've got a decade plus worth of content there. So please subscribe, like, and comment today. Check it out over on youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio or on all of the social channels, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and TikTok. Just look for at Rebel Force Radio, or in the case of Twitter, at RFR, Rebel Force. Uh, the website for all things and everything Rebel Force Radio is rebelforceradio.com. Go to rebelforceradio.com. And uh, in addition to all of the shows that can be heard and uh, listen to through the regular feed, but you also get little tastes and little uh, tidbits uh, samples of some of the stuff that's only available through becoming a Patreon member. Uh, Q and A. Uh, that's a good example there. You can check it out. Get the uh, the preview so you can get a sense of what you're getting when you become a supporter of us here at Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. But uh, above all, the best thing you can do to help us out here at RFR is just to do what you're doing right now. Listen to the show. Watch the clips and the highlights on YouTube. Uh, and spread the word to your friends. We all have Star Wars fans, uh, you know, around the office. Yes. And uh, with Mandalorian Season 3, they're going to come out of the woodwork, man. You know, these are people that you're going to have to explain to them. How did how did Baby Yoda get back to the Mando? Because yes. they didn't watch Book of Boba Fett, Ugh. right? Lightweights. Yeah, you're going to have to communicate. And, <laughs> and, and you know what? Instead of doing all that heavy lifting... Say, all right, just go to rebelforceradio.com. Yes. They're going to tell you everything that you need to know. So spread the word. We appreciate it very much. Um, in addition to that, if you can subscribe to the podcast, we'd love to have your subscription. If your podcatcher of choice allows you to do so, we'd love to have your reviews. We just have one simple rule here. You have to make it good or I will find you and I will kill you. <laughs> and we'll be back next week, starting with uh, two episodes. After shows, remember, Mando Wednesdays, 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, and the Bad Batch Thursdays, 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. We'll have all kinds of reminders on our social media channels, and uh, if you also follow us on YouTube, you'll get those notifications, so make sure you do that. But until then, for Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. I'm Jimmy. And remember, the Force will be with you, always. This is the way. 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 This is the way.